This is Audible. Friday Night Bites, a Chicagoland vampires novel, by Chloe Neal. Chapter Thirteen. They'll eat you alive. Ethan, in black pants and a snug, long-sleeved black shirt, stood at the threshold of Mallory's kitchen, hands in his pockets. His hair was tied back. The casualness of the ensemble indicating he had plans that didn't involve negotiations or diplomacy. Mallory and Catcher stood just behind him. Morgan's eyes snapped open, emotion tightening his features, and for a fraction of a second, silvering his eyes. I was just kind of dumbfounded. Why was Ethan here? If you want me to court her properly, Sullivan, you're going to need to give us some time alone. The words and tone were for Ethan, but his gaze was on me. My apologies for the interruption, he said. But he couldn't have sounded more sarcastic. In fact, he sounded plenty happy to interrupt. It was a long, quiet, awkward moment before Morgan finally looked over at him. They exchanged manly nods, these two masters, the two men who together controlled the fates of two-thirds of the vampires in Chicago. Two men who claimed a little too much authority over my time. I'm sorry to steal her away, Ethan said, but we have Cadogan House business. Of course. Morgan turned back to me, and in full view of God and the assorted house guests, kissed me softly. At least we got dinner. I looked up into baleful eyes. I'm sorry. Sure. Uncomfortable silence fell again until Morgan offered, I guess I should get going and leave you two to your business. His tone was petulant, as if he wasn't entirely convinced Ethan was here for Cadogan-related reasons. God only knew why Ethan had decided to darken Mallory's door. If he needed me, why hadn't he just paged me? I'll walk you out, I said. Ethan, Catcher, and Mallory turned to their sides in the hallway, allowing us egress from the kitchen. Morgan walked out, me behind, both of us ignoring Ethan as we passed him. I walked to the door and resumed my position on the stoop. It's not your fault, Morgan said, his eyes on the house. There was no doubt about that. It's not like I invited Ethan over. But I wondered if he really thought me truly blameless. I'm sure he mostly blamed Ethan, but Morgan had raised questions before about my relationship with my master. This probably wasn't helping. Whatever his thoughts, he shrugged off the gloom and gave me a cheery smile, then bobbed his head toward the brownstone. I'm sure being an omnipotent master has its advantages. Having people at your beck and call. Don't you have people at your beck and call? I asked, reminding him that he was one of the masters he'd been referring to. Well, I do have them. But I don't think I've officially becked or called them yet. And I suppose this is the price of dating the hot shit Cadogan Sentinel. I'm not sure about the hot shit, but the Sentinel part is true enough. I cast my own dark glance at the doorway. Ethan and Catcher communed in the hall. Although I have no idea what this is about. I'd like to know. I looked back at him, hoping he wasn't about to pump me for information. That concern must have shown on my face. He shook his head. I'm not going to ask. I'd just like to know. Then his tone went flat. Master Vampire flat. He must have been practicing. I hope that if it's something that affects us all, he'll fill us in. Don't bet on that, I thought. After we said our goodbyes, I shut the door behind me and found everyone still standing in the hallway. Catcher and Ethan were in identical poses, chest back, arms crossed, chins dropped, warriors in concentration. This was serious then, and not just a means for Ethan to further irritate me. When I joined them, they expanded their semicircle to let me in. I've learned, Ethan began, that a rave was held earlier tonight. We need to check it out. We also need to hope that we're the only ones who've heard about it. 
How Ethan had learned about the rave, given that his usual source for such things was standing beside him, was an interesting question. Catcher and I were apparently on the same wavelength. How did you find out? he asked. Peter, Ethan said, he received a tip. That made sense, I thought, since Peter was known for his contacts. A friend of his, a bartender at a club in Naperville, heard two vampires discussing the fact that they'd received the text message announcing the rave. Alcohol loosens the lips of the fanged? Catcher sardonically asked. Apparently so, Ethan agreed. The bartender didn't recognize the vampires. They were likely drifter rogues. By the time Peter heard from his source and contacted Luke, the rave was long since over. So we can't stop it? I asked. Ethan shook his head. But we have an opportunity to investigate with significantly less political maneuvering than might be required if we were crashing the party. Ethan looked at Catcher. And speaking of political maneuvering, can you join us? Catcher gave a single nod, then looked at me. Is your sword in the car? I nodded. Will I need it? We'll know when we get there. I've got some gear stashed here, flashlights and whatnot. He glanced at Ethan. Did you bring your sword? No, he said. I was out. We all stood silently, waiting for Ethan to elaborate, but got nothing. And I suppose I'll play vamp outfitter, and I need to call Chuck, he said, then whipped a cell phone out of his pocket and flipped it open. And we're supposed to be diplomatic corps, he muttered, not the hardy boys. You can see how well that's working out for us. Mallory rolled her eyes at the mini tirade. I figured it wasn't the first time she'd heard it. I'll get dinner cleaned up, she offered. Whoa, 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 Catcher said, stopping her escape with a hand on her arm. Sorry, kid, but you're coming with us. With us? I repeated, Mallory and I sharing the same deer-in-the-headlights look. I knew he wanted to foster her learning, but I wasn't sure this was the time for that. She needs the experience, Catcher answered, his eyes on Mallory. And I want you there with me. You're my partner, my asset. You can do it. There was a tightness around her eyes, but she nodded. That's my girl, he murmured, and pressed his lips to her temple. Then he released her, put the cell up to his ear, and trotted down the hallway toward the back of the house. Sullivan, he called out. You owe me one big fuck of a favor. And Merritt, you might want to change your shoes. Noted, Ethan replied, on both counts. Mallory and I looked down at my pretty ballet flats. Red or not, I probably didn't want to wear them to investigate a bloodletting. I'll grab a pair of boots or something, she said. I know you left some here. Although I undoubtedly had a better sense of where my remaining clothes were, Mal walked away, leaving me to babysit Ethan. Not that I could blame her for taking the out. We stood there silently for a moment both of us making every effort to avoid looking at each other. Ethan's gaze lifted to the photographs along the hallway wall, the same wall I'd been pressed up against a couple of hours ago. Why me? I asked him. He turned back to me, brow arched. Excuse me? His voice was frosty. Apparently he was fully in master and commander mode. Lucky me. Why are you here? You knew that I had plans tonight. You saw me leave. Luke was at the house when I left, as were the rest of the guards. They're all more experienced than I am. You could have called one of them. Asked for their help. And given me a break, I silently added. Given me a chance to get over the training session. To have a break from Selena and my father and vampire drama. To just be me. Luke is busy protecting our vampires. Luke is your bodyguard. He swore an oath to protect you. An irritated shake of his head. You're in this already. Luke was there with you when you explained the raves, helped you plan for my involvement, and I'm sure you've brought him up to speed about what we learned so far. He knows everything that I know. Luke was busy. I was busy. Luke isn't you. 
The words were quick, clipped, and completely dumbfounding. That was twice that he'd surprised me in the span of a few minutes. Catcher was lumbering down the hall again before I could fathom a response. The mesh strap of a black canvas duffel bag in one hand, the black lacquer sheath of his katana in the other. Your grandfather is now in the know, he said when he reached us, then glanced at Ethan. If I'm going, that means we're doing this official-like. I'm looking into this on behalf of the Umbud's office, and, therefore, on behalf of the city. So there will be no need to contact additional authorities, Ethan concluded, and they shared a knowing nod. I heard Mallory's footsteps on the stairs. She appeared with an old pair of knee-high leather boots in her hands. In case there's, you know, fluids, she said, handing me the shoes. I figured the taller the better. Good call. My shoes in hand, I looked at Mallory, who then turned to look at Catcher. Her brows lifted. There was stubbornness in the set of her jaw. Clearly, she wasn't going to give in as easily as he might have wished. It'll be good practice, he told her. I have weeks of training to accomplish practice, Catcher. I'm an ad exec, or was, anyway. I have no business running around Chicago in the middle of the night. She flailed an arm nervously in the air. Cleaning up after vampires? No offense, Merritt, she said with a quick apologetic glance. I shrugged, knowing better than to argue. Catcher rubbed his lips together, irritation obviously rising. That irritation was clear in the twitch of his jaw and the tingle of magic that was beginning to rise, unseen but tangible, in the air. I need a partner, he said. A second opinion. Call Jeff. In the years I'd known Mallory, I'm not sure I'd ever seen her this stubborn. Either she wasn't eager to visit the rave site, or she wasn't thrilled about the idea of testing whatever powers Catcher was expecting her to practice. I could sympathize on both counts. Catcher rubbed his lips together, then dropped the bag on the floor. Give us a minute. I nodded. Come on. I said to Ethan, taking his hand and ignoring the small spark of contact that tingled my palm as I pulled him toward the front door. He followed without comment and kept his hand in mine until we reached the front door, until I unlaced our fingers to grab my keys from the table. The evening was cool when we stepped outside, the fresh air a relief. I sat down on the top step of the stoop and exchanged date shoes for work shoes and walked to the car, grabbed my sword, and dropped off the flats. When I turned around again, Mallory and Catcher were on the stoop, locking the door behind them. She came down the sidewalk first and stopped when she got to me. You good? I asked her. When she rolled her eyes in irritation, I knew she'd be okay. I love him, Merritt. I swear to God I do. But he is seriously, seriously an ass. I looked around her at Catcher, who gave me a sly smile. He may have been an ass, but he knew how to work our girl out of her fear. He has his moments, I reminded her. Ethan's car was too small for the four of us. Mine, being bright orange, wasn't exactly suitable for recon work. So we settled into Catcher's sedan. Boys in the front, girls in the back. The katanas across my and Mallory's laps. Catcher drove south and east, and the car was silent until I spoke up. So, what should we expect? Blood, Catcher and Ethan simultaneously answered. Worst case, Catcher added, the bodies that accompany it. He glanced over at Ethan. If things are that bad, you know I'll have to call someone, Catcher said. We can blur the jurisdictional boundaries, but I'll be obligated to report that. Understood. Ethan said quietly, probably imagining worst-case scenarios. Lovely, Mallory muttered, rubbing a hand nervously across her forehead. That's lovely. No one should be there, Ethan said, a softness in his voice. And given that vampires rarely drink their humans to death. Present company excluded, I muttered, raising my hand to my neck. It's unlikely we'll find bodies. Unlikely, Catcher said, but not impossible. It's not like these particular vamps are big on following the rules. 
Let's just be prepared for the worst, hope for the best. And what am I truly capable of contributing to this mission? Mallory asked. As if an answer, she closed her eyes, her angelic face calm, lips moving to the cadence of a mantra I couldn't hear. When she opened them again, she looked down at her palm. I followed her gaze, a glowing orb of yellow light floated just above her hand, a soft, almost matte ball of light that illuminated the back seat of the car. Nicely done, Catcher said, eyes flicking back to us in the rearview mirror. Ethan half turned in his seat, his own eyes widening at the sight of the orb in her hand. What is it? I whispered to her, as if greater volume would dissipate the glow. It's, her hand shook, and the orb wavered. It's the condensation of magic, the first key, power. Her fingers contracted, and the orb flattened into a plane of light and disappeared. Her hand still extended, she glanced over at me. This girl who could single-handedly channel magic into light. And I understood perfectly the expression on her face. Who am I? This is not all you are, Catcher quietly said, as if reading her thoughts. And that's not why I brought you. You know better than that. And the first key isn't only about channeling power into light. You know that too. She shrugged and looked outside the window. It was funny, I thought, that we'd had similar conversations with our respective bosses as we adjusted to our powers. I wasn't sure if she was fortunate or not to be sleeping with the man who critiqued her. Boys, I muttered. She glanced over at me, total agreement in her eyes. We drove through residential neighborhoods, passing one span of houses or townhouses, or townhouses being rehabbed after another. As was the way in Chicago, the tenor of the street changed every few blocks from tidy condos with neatly trimmed hedges to run-down apartment buildings with rusting, half-hung gates. We stopped in an industrial neighborhood near the lake in front of a house, the single remaining residential building on the block, that had definitely seen better days. It was the final remnant of what had likely once been a prosperous neighborhood, a remnant now surrounded by lots empty of everything but trash, scraggly brush, and industrial debris. The Queen Anne-style home, illuminated by the orange glow of a single overhead street lamp, had probably been a princess in its time, a once inviting porch flanked by fluted columns, a second-floor balcony, gingerbread, brackets now rotting and hanging from their corners, paint peeled in wide strips from the wood shingles, and random sprouts of grass pushed for life amidst a front yard tangled with discarded plastic. Catcher's duffel bag rested on the seat between Mallory and me, and I handed it to him through the gap in the front seats. He unzipped it and pulled out four flashlights, then re-zipped the bag and placed it between him and Ethan. He passed out the flashlights to the rest of us. Let's go. Katana in hand, I opened my door. The scent hit when we stepped outside the car, flashlights and swords in hand. Blood the iron tang of it. I took a sudden breath, the urge to drink in the scent nearly overwhelming. And even more problematic, because she stirred. Ethan stopped and turned to me, an eyebrow raised in question. I swallowed down the craving and pushed down the vampire, glad I'd had blood earlier. I nodded at him. I'm fine. The dilapidation and lingering odor of decay helped staunch the need. I'm okay. What's wrong? Mallory asked. Blood, Ethan somberly said, eyes on the house. The smell of it remains. Mallory handed Catcher's belted sword to Ethan, and we buckled our katanas around our waists. The neighborhood was silent but for the breeze-blown crackle of a floating plastic bag and the faraway thunder of a freight train. Without comment, Catcher took the lead. He flipped on his flashlight, the circle of light bobbing before him as he crossed the street and walked toward the house. Ethan followed, then Mallory, then me. We stood at the curb, the four of us in line, stalling. Is anyone still in there? 
Mallory asked, trepidation in her voice. No, Ethan and I answered simultaneously. The lack of sound, and thank God for predatory improvements in hearing, made that clear. Catcher took another step forward, fisted his hands on his hips, and scanned the house. I'm in first, he said, exercising his umbud authority. Then Ethan, Mallory, Merritt. Be prepared to draw. He looked at Mallory. Don't go in too far. Just keep your mind open, like we talked about. Mal nodded, seemed to firm her courage. I'd have squeezed her hand if I'd had any courage to offer. As it was, my right hand was sweating around the nubby barrel of the flashlight, the fingers of my left nervously tapping the handle of my sword. Catcher started forward, and we followed in the order he'd set, Ethan and me with katanas at our sides. This time, the sound of Ethan's voice in my head didn't surprise me. You can control the craving? I assured him I could, and asked, What am I looking for? Evidence. An indication of house involvement. How many? Was there a struggle? Our line of amateur investigators picked our way up the sidewalk, over broken concrete, broken glass, and plastic soda bottles. The small porch at the front of the house creaked ominously when Catcher stepped onto it. After waiting to be sure it wouldn't collapse beneath him, we followed. I risked a glance through a slender, dirt-smeared window. The room was empty but for the skeletal remains of a massive chandelier, all but a handful of its crystal gone. It seemed an oddly appropriate symbol of the house's current condition. Catcher pushed open the ancient door. The smell of dampness, decay, and blood spilled onto the sidewalk. I breathed through my mouth to avoid the temptation, however minimal, of the blood. We trundled into what had once been a foyer and spun our flashlights around. There was rotting mahogany beneath our feet and flocked velvet wallpaper around us, marred by ripping peels, water stains, and slinking trickles of water. At the other end of the room, a gigantic stairway curved up to the second floor. Piles of wood and congealed paint cans were stashed in a corner. The rooms dotted here and there with threadbare pieces of heavy furniture. The building had been stripped of moldings, light fixtures gone, probably to be sold off. I didn't see any blood, although the smell of it hung in the air. Choose your adventure, vampires, Catcher advised in a whisper. East or west? Ethan looked toward the rooms on the east side of the house then toward the stairway in front of us, his head lifted as his gaze followed the rising staircase to the second floor. Up, he decided, Merritt with me, Catcher, first floor. Done, Catcher responded. He turned to Mallory and tapped a finger against his right temple, then his chest, then his temple again. Mallory nodded. Must have been some kind of secret sorcerer code. She squeezed my hand, then followed him to the left. The two of us alone in the foyer, Ethan glanced at me. Sentinel, what do you know? I lifted my own gaze to the stairway and closed my eyes. Vision gone, I let the sounds and scents surround me. I'd felt the stirrings of magic before, when Selina had tested me, when Mallory and Catcher fought, and at my commendation, when I'd basked in the flow of it, the air thick with the lambent magic of dozens of vampires. Here, there were no currents. If any magic remained in the house, it was minimal. Maybe a tingle here and there, but nothing strong enough for me to separate, identify. The house was equally silent of living things, but for the downstairs movements of Mallory and Catcher, the steady sound of Ethan's heartbeat, and the disturbing scurry of tiny slithering things beneath our feet and in the walls. I shivered squeezing my eyes closed and forcing myself to ignore the ambient sound. I focused on scent, imagined myself a predator, primed for the hunt, full though I may have been of salmon and asparagus. The tang of blood was obvious, in such quantity that it floated like a cloud of invisible smoke. Flowing down the stairs and through the room, overlying the smells of mildew and standing water. I stood quietly for a moment ensuring that I had control of myself to continue to investigate. 
ensuring that she was sufficiently locked down to preclude her mad rush to the second floor, to the blood. In the silence, the quietness, I caught something else. Something above the mustiness and dust and blood. Something animal. I tilted my head. Instincts peaked. Was it prey? Predator? It was faint, but it was there. A trace of fur and musk. I opened my eyes, found Ethan eyeing me curiously. Animals? He nodded. Maybe animals. Maybe shifters who aren't skilled at masking their forms. Good catch. He beckoned me with a hand and headed for the stairs. Fear and adrenaline making me unusually compliant. I followed without comment, but switched our positions at the landing. In appropriate sentinel manner, I took point, keeping my body between his and whatever nasties hid in the dark. He stayed close behind as I used my flashlight to guide our way across the glass-strewn floor. Moonlight streamed through dirty windows, so we probably could have managed the exploration without the flashlight, but the tool in my hand was comforting. And since I was in the lead, I wasn't about to turn it off. Typical of an older home, the upper floor contained a maze of small bedrooms. The smell of blood grew stronger as we passed through the rooms on the right side, the wooden floors creaking as we progressed, the beam of our flashlights occasionally illuminating an abandoned piece of furniture or a puddle of dirty liquid being fed from a rust-colored stain in the ceiling. The faint smell of animal lingered, but it lay beneath the other scents in the room. If a shifter had been here, it was in passing. He or she hadn't been a key player. We kept moving through the tiny bedrooms to the back of the house until we reached the room at the end of the line. I paused before entering it, smell of blood suddenly blossoming into the hallway. Adrenaline pumping, I locked down my vampire and circled the beam of light around the room, then froze. Ethan, I know, he said, stepping beside me. I see it. This was where they'd congregated. The floor was littered with random trash, soda cans and candy wrappers. A mirrored bureau stood along one wall, a reflection warped by the effect of time on the mirror's silver backing. Most importantly, three dirty, stained mattresses lay in various spots around the room. The blue and white ticking that covered them bore obvious bloodstains, large bloodstains. Ethan stepped around me and used the beam of his flashlight to survey the room, wall to wall, corner to corner. Probably three humans, he concluded. One for each mattress, one for each spill of blood. Maybe six vampires, two per person, one at a wrist, the other at the neck. No bodies and no sign of struggle. Blood, yes, but not obscene quantities. They appear to have stopped themselves. There was relief in his voice. No murders, but nor did the humans receive whatever benefits they imagined they'd get. His voice had turned drier at the end. Clearly not much of a fan of the would-be fanged. Benefits, I repeated, swinging the beam to where Ethan stood, free hand on his hip, gaze shifting between the two mattresses that lay closest together. When we were in your office, you mentioned something about becoming a Renfield? A human servant, he said, offering protection to a vampire during daylight hours. Perhaps interacting with humans on the vampire's behalf. But we haven't had Renfields for centuries. A human might also imagine they would be given the gift of immortality. But if a vampire was to make another... He paused and kneeled down to inspect the middle mattress. This is not the manner in which such an act would occur. I checked out the other mattress, the circle of blood upon it. Ethan? Yes, Merritt? If drinking is so problematic, so risky to humans, why allow it? Why not remove the risk and outlaw drinking altogether? Make everyone use the bag stuff. Then there's no politics to allowing the raves. You could outright ban them. Ethan was quiet long enough that I turned back to him and found him staring at me with eyes of pure, melting quicksilver. My lips parted, the breath stuttering out of me. 
Because, whatever the politics of it, we are vampires. Ethan parted his lips, showed me the needle-sharp tips of his fangs. I was shocked to the core that he let me see him in full hunger, shocked and aroused by it. And when he tipped his head down, silvered eyes boring into me, I swallowed down a rise of lust so thick and swift it tripped my heart. The sound of my heartbeat, the hollow thud of it, pounded in my ears. Ethan held out a hand, palm up, an invitation. Offer yourself, he whispered, his voice in my mind. I gripped the handle of my katana. I knew what I wanted to do. Step forward, arch my neck, and offer him access. For a second, maybe two, I considered it. I let myself wonder what it might be like to let him bite. But my control, already weakened by the smell of blood, threatened to tip. If I let my fangs descend, if I let her take over, there was a good chance I'd end up sinking them into the long line of his neck, or letting him do the same to me. And while I wasn't naive enough to deny that I was curious, intrigued by the possibility, this was neither the time nor the place. I didn't want my first real experience in sharing blood to be here in the midst of industrial squalor, in a house where the trust of humans had so recently been violated. So I fought for control, shaking my head clear. Point made, I told him. Ethan arched a brow as he snatched back his hand, clenching his fist as he regained his own control. He retracted his fangs, his eyes cleared fading from silver to emerald green. When he looked at me again, his expression was clinical. My cheeks flushed with embarrassment. It had all been a teaching point then, not about desire or bloodlust, but an opportunity for Ethan to demonstrate his restraint. I felt ridiculously naive. Our reaction to blood, Ethan matter-of-factly began, is predatory, instinctual. While we may need to seclude our habits, assimilate into the larger population of humans, we are still vampires. Suppression favors none of us. I looked around the room at the peeling paint, balled-up newspapers, spare mattresses, and crimson dots scattered across the splintered hardwood floor. Suppression leads to this, I said. Yes, Sentinel. I was Sentinel again. Things were back to normal. We searched the room but found no indication of houses or anything else that might identify the drinking vamps. They'd avoided leaving obvious evidence behind, which wasn't all that surprising for folks who would travel to a deserted house in exchange for a few illicit sips. We know humans were here, Ethan said, that blood was taken, but that's it. Even if we called someone in, without more evidence of what went on, the only thing to come from further investigation would be bad press for us. I assumed Ethan meant he wasn't willing to involve the CPD in the rave investigation. I didn't disagree with him, especially since Catcher was here on behalf of the Umbud's office. On the other hand, if Ethan was really that comfortable suppressing information, he probably wouldn't have bothered justifying it to me. I guess that makes sense, I said. The locust, Ethan suddenly said, and I frowned in confusion, thinking I'd missed something. But he hadn't been talking to me. Catcher and Mallory stood in the doorway behind us. They both looked fine, neither showing any signs of having been accosted by a loitering raver. Catcher's expression was back to his normal one, slightly bored. Mallory cast uncomfortable glances at the mattresses on the floor. Yeah. Catcher agreed. It looks like the action went down here. He surveyed the room, then walked a loop around it, arms crossed over his chest, face pinched in concentration. Three humans? He finally asked. That's what it looks like, Ethan confirmed. Possibly six vampires, and who knows if there were observers. We found no evidence of houses. Even if house vamps were involved, Catcher said, meeting Ethan in front of the center mattress. It's unlikely they'd leave any noticeable evidence behind, especially since the houses don't sanction this kind of conduct. 
much less drinking for most of them. Ethan made a sound of agreement. Silence fell as the men reviewed the dirty beds before them. They consulted quietly as they walked around, crouched before, and pointed over the mattresses. I looked back at Mallory, who shrugged in response, neither of us privy to their conversations. Catcher finally stood again, then glanced back at Mallory. Are you ready? His voice was soft, careful. She swallowed, then nodded. I wasn't sure what she was going to do, but I felt for her, assuming Mal was about to dive headfirst into the supernatural pool. Having taken that dive as well, I knew the first step off the board was a little daunting. She held out her right hand, palm up, and stared down at it. Look through it, Catcher whispered, but Mallory didn't waver. The air in the room seemed to warm, to become thicker, an after-effect of the magic that Mallory was funneling, of the magic that was beginning to warp the air above her hand. Breathe through it, Catcher said. I lifted my gaze from Mallory's hand to his eyes and saw the sensuality there. Vampires could feel magic. We could sense its presence. But sorcerers' relationships with magic were something altogether different. Something altogether lustier, if the look in his eyes was any indication. Mal's tongue darted out to wet her lips, but her blue eyes stayed focused on the shimmer above her hand. Blood red she suddenly said, her voice barely audible, eerily gravelly. In the rise of the moon, and like the moon, they will rise and they will fall, these white city kings, and she will triumph. She will triumph until he comes, until he comes. Silence. It was a prophecy of some kind, the same skill I'd seen Catcher perform in Cadogan House once before. Ethan glanced over at Catcher. Does that mean anything to you? Catcher shook his head ruefully. I suppose we shouldn't deride the gift, but Nostradamus was easier to understand. I glanced back at Mallory. Her eyes were still closed, sweat dampening her brow, her outstretched arms shaking with exertion. Guys, I said, I think she's about had it. They glanced back. Mallory. Catcher softly said. She didn't respond. Mallory! Her eyes snapped up, her biceps shaking. Let it go, he said. She nodded, wet her lips, glanced down at her hand, and spread her fingers. The shimmer of air disappeared. After a second, Mal wiped at her forehead with the back of her wrist. Are you okay? She looked at me, nodded matter-of-factly. Just hard work. Did I say anything helpful? I shrugged. Not so much helpful as super creepy. I think we've gotten everything we can get, Ethan said. Unless you've any other ideas. Not much, Catcher answered. Vague sense of fear? The suggestion of an animal? He looked between us. I assume you got that. We both nodded. Nothing at all beyond that. Nothing else recognizable in the current. And I'm not sure the shifter was here when this happened. Maybe afterward. Either way, no sense that the media has discovered this place, at least not yet. Catcher looked around the room, hands on his hips. Speaking of, shall I call in a crew? Have the place stripped? Cleaned? It hadn't occurred to me that the Umbud's office had the authority or manpower to erase the evidence. They referred to themselves as liaisons, go-betweens. I guess they were a little more proactive than that. Can you do that? I asked. Catcher gave me a sardonic look. You really don't talk to your grandfather very often. I talk to my grandfather plenty. Catcher snorted and turned, led us from the room. Not about the good stuff. The city of Chicago has been keeping the sup's existence under wraps since before the fire, Merritt. And that's not because incidents don't happen. It's because the incidents are taken care of. And the city is none the wiser? He nodded. That's the way it works. People weren't prepared to know. Still aren't, for some of the shenanigans vamps get into. We headed to the stairs in the same order we'd entered the house. If they were prepared now, 
Mallory said. We wouldn't be here. I mean, I know you guys have penance and bumper stickers and whatnot, but drinking in the dark in a dilapidated house doesn't exactly scream assimilation. And now there's that business with Tate. That stopped both Ethan and me in the middle of the staircase. What business with Tate? he asked. Mallory gave Catcher a pointed look. You didn't tell them? Other business to attend to, Catcher responded, hitching a thumb at the second floor behind us. One crisis at a time. Catcher continued down the stairs. With no other choice, we followed. The silence thick enough to cut through. Ethan practically trotted down the staircase. When we reached the front door, then the porch, then the sidewalk, Ethan stopped, hands on his hips. Mallory made a low whistle of warning. I prepared for Ethan's outburst, predicting quietly. And the shit will hit the fan in four. Three. What business with Tate? Ethan repeated, an edge of anger in his voice. I bit back a smile. Glad Catcher was the one Ethan was about to light into. That made a nice change. Catcher stopped and turned back to Ethan. Tate's staff has been calling the office, he said. He's been asking questions about vampire leadership, about the houses, about the Sentinel. Since I was the only Sentinel in town, I perked up. About me? Catcher nodded. The General Assembly agreed to forego vamp management legislation this year in lieu of investigation to ensure that nothing too prejudicial was passed. But that wasn't too hard a choice, since Greater Illinois doesn't have to deal with vampires in their midst. All the houses are in Chicago. The city's council's getting antsy, though. I know you and Gray talk to your aldermen, Ethan nodded at this, but the rest of the council has concerns. There's talk about zoning, about curfews, regulations. And what's Tate's position on that stuff, I asked. Catcher shrugged. Who the hell knows what Tate thinks? And he still hasn't come to any of us, Ethan muttered, eyes on the ground, brow furrowed. He hasn't talked to Scott or Morgan or me. He's probably not ready to talk to you in person, Catcher said. Maybe doing his groundwork before he sets up that meeting? Or he's keeping his distance on purpose, Ethan muttered. He shook his head in reprobation, then glanced at me. What does he want to know about merit? Likes, dislikes, favorite flowers, Mallory put in. So not helping, I whispered. I'm not kidding. I think he's totally crushing you. I snorted in disbelief. Yeah, the mayor of Chicago is crushing on me. That's likely. Unlike Ethan, I had met Tate. And although he seemed likable enough, there was no way he was crushing on me. He just wants information, Catcher said. I think at this point it's a vague curiosity. And frankly, his interest could be related to her parentage rather than her affiliation. Ethan leaned toward me. At least I know you aren't feeding Tate information, or you'd have surely ferreted that out. I clenched my jaw at the insinuation, which he'd made before, that I was some kind of informational spigot between the house and Tate's office. I decided I'd been on the receiving end of one too many speeches and snarky comments today. I glanced at Catcher and asked the same favor he'd asked of us earlier. Would you two give us a minute? Catcher looked between us, grinned cheekily. Knock yourself out, kid. We'll be in the car. I waited until the car doors were shut before I stepped forward, stopped within inches of Ethan's body. Look. I know why you gave me that speech earlier today. I know you have an obligation to protect your vampires, but irrespective of the way that I was made, I have done everything that you have asked of me. I've taken training, I've given up my dissertation, I moved into the house, I got you in to see my father, I got you into the Breckenridge house, and I've dated the man you asked me to. I pointed at the house behind us. And even though I was supposed to get a few hours free from the drama of Cadogan House tonight with said man, I followed you here because you requested it. At some point, Ethan, you might consider giving me a little credit. I didn't wait for him to answer, but turned on my heel and went to the car. 
I opened the back door, climbed inside, and slammed it shut behind me. Catcher caught my gaze in the rearview mirror. Feel better? Is he standing there with that dumbstruck expression on his face? There was a pause while he checked, then a chuckle. Yes, he is. Then, yes, I feel better. The car was quiet on the ride north to Wicker Park. Ethan pissed at Catcher for not sharing information about Tate within his preferred time frame, i.e. immediately. Mallory napping in the back seat, apparently worn out by her magical exertions, and Catcher humming along with an ABBA marathon he'd found on an AM radio station. We reached the brownstone and said our goodbyes. Catcher reminded me that I was scheduled to apprentice with him first thing tomorrow evening, and Mallory and I teared up at her transition to apprentice sorceress, and the fact that my time with her for the next six weeks would be largely limited to phone calls. But I trusted Catcher, and given that Selena was on the loose, I was glad Mal would be learning more about her gifts, her skills, her ability to wield magic. The more protection she had, the better I felt, and I was pretty sure Catcher felt the same. Since we'd arrived separately, Ethan and I drove our respective cars back to Catagon House. Him in the sleek Mercedes, me in my boxy Volvo. I parked the Volvo on the street. Glad I'd completed my round of obligations for the night so I could have at least a few hours to myself. But he met me in the foyer, cream-colored envelope in his hand. I adjusted my own armfuls of stuff, mail, shoes, sword, and took it from him. This was messengered to you, he said. I opened it up. Inside was an invitation to a gala at my parents' house the next night. I made a face. Tonight had been long enough. It didn't look like tomorrow would afford much relief. Lovely, I said, then showed him the invite. He read it over, then nodded. I'll arrange for a dress. You have katana training with Catcher tomorrow. At my nod, he nodded back. Then we'll leave shortly after. What's on the agenda? Ethan turned and began walking back toward his office. I followed him, at least as far as the staircase. The agenda, he said when we paused, is to continue our investigations. Your father is aware that we are interested in a threat involving the Breckenridges. Given what I know of him, it's likely he'll have done some checking of his own. You planned it, I said, thinking of the seeds he'd planted with my father. Told him just enough about the Breckenridges, about the danger facing us, to make him want to ask questions. Although I wasn't thrilled about the thought of going home, I could appreciate a good strategy when I heard one. That's not bad, Sullivan. He gave me a dry look before turning toward his office. I appreciate the vote of confidence. Until dusk, he said, and walked away. Once in my room, I dumped my sword and my pile of mail, then kicked off my shoes. I'd left my cell phone in my room, since I'd planned to spend the evening with the only people likely to call me, but found a voicemail waiting. It was from Morgan. He said he was checking in, ensuring that I'd gotten home safely. But I could hear the questions in his voice, where I'd been what I'd been doing, what had been important enough to motivate Ethan to pull in a few months old sentinel for duty. I still wasn't sure I had an answer to the last one. I checked the clock. It was nearly four in the morning. I guessed Morgan would still be awake. But after a moment of hesitation, I opted not to call him back. I didn't want to dance around issues, and I wasn't in the mood to deal with his less than veiled animosity toward Ethan. The night had been long enough, contentious enough, without that. With dawn threatening, I stripped out of my date ensemble and got into pajamas, then washed my face, grabbed a moleskin journal and a pen, and climbed into bed. I scribbled random notes as the sun rose about vampires, the houses, the philosophy of drinking, and fell asleep, pen in hand. Chapter 14. The Center Cannot Hold I woke happy, at least until I remembered what the evening had in store. I grumbled and grabbed the invitation to the party at my parents' house. 
This one was a gala for a teen mentoring program. It's not that the cause wasn't legitimate, but I always wondered about my father's motivations, his interest in making connections, in shaking hands was at least as big as any interest he had in actually helping the organization. Rising tides lift all boats, I thought, and put the invitation on the bed. I sat up and pushed the hair out of my eyes, then uncurled my legs and hit the floor. I didn't bother to shower, knowing I'd just get sweaty again during my training session, but changed into my catcher-approved ensemble, bandeau bra and barely-there shorts throwing a track jacket over the top so I'd be decent during the drive. Just as I zipped up the jacket, there was a knock at the door. I opened it and found Helen in the hallway in a tidy tweed suit. Hello, dear, she said, holding out a royal blue garment bag emblazoned with the logo of a chic chic store in the loop. I was just dropping off your gown. I took the bag from her hands, the weight not as heavy as I'd have expected, given the size of the bag. Her hands free, she pulled a small pink notebook from the pocket of her nubby pink suit jacket. Nodding, she read it over. Tonight is a black tie event. The color theme is black and white, she read, then lifted her gaze to mine. That helped my selection process, of course but it took no small bit of finagling to obtain a gown this quickly. It was delivered moments ago. It bothered me, more than it should have, that she'd picked out the dress, that Ethan hadn't picked out the dress. That it bothered me was just so wrong in so many ways. Thank you, I told her. I appreciate the effort. More's the pity she couldn't have taken my place. Of course, Helen said. I need to get back downstairs. Plenty of work to do. Do enjoy the party. She smiled and tucked the notebook back into her pocket. And be careful with the dress. It was rather an investment. I frowned down at the garment bag. Define investment. Nearly twelve, actually. Twelve? Twelve hundred dollars? I stared at the dress bag horrified at the thought that I was going to be responsible for four figures of Catagon investment. Helen chuckled. Twelve thousand dollars, dear. She dropped that bomb, then headed back down the hallway, completely missing my look of abject horror. Ever so carefully, as if carrying the Gutenberg Bible, I laid the dress on my bed. Tick two, I murmured, and unzipped the bag. A soft sound escaped me. It was black silk, a fabric so delicate I could barely feel it between my fingers. And it was, indeed, a ball gown. A square strapless bodice that dropped to a spill of the luscious inky silk. I wiped my hands on my shorts, pulled the dress from the bag and held it up against my chest, spinning just to watch the skirt move. And move it did. The silk flowed like black water, the fabric the darkest shade of black I'd ever seen. It wasn't the kind of black that you confused with navy in the dressing room. It was black, moonless, midnight black. It was stunning. My cell rang, and I hugged the dress to my body with my free hand, scanned the caller ID, and flipped it open. Oh, my God, you should see this dress I'm wearing tonight. Did you just say something complimentary about a dress? Where's my merit? What have you done with her? I'm serious, Mallory. It's amazing. Black silk, this ball gown thing. I stood in front of the mirror, half turned. It's beautiful. Seriously, I'm totally weirded out by the girly nature of this conversation. And yet, it's kind of like you're growing up. Do you think Judy Bloom made a book about adolescent vampires? Are you there, God? It's me, Merritt. Mallory snorted, obviously pleased with herself. Ha ha ha, I said, placing the dress carefully on top of the garment bag. I got an invitation to a deal at my parents, so we're heading back to Oak Park in a bit. Oh, that's classy, vampire. Forget about your old friends now that you're all high society. I'm torn between two answers. First, the obvious one. 
I just saw you last night. Also acceptable. Were we friends? I thought I was using you for rent and gratuitous branding. My turn to laugh, she said, instead of actually laughing. Seriously, I'm on the road, driving to Schaumburg, and I wanted to check on you. I assume you and Darth Sullivan got back to Catagon okay? We didn't get chased by raving vampires, so I'd call it a successful return trip. Was Morgan okay about having to leave last night? Phone pinched between shoulder and ear, I tightened my ponytail. He probably wasn't thrilled about being replaced by Ethan, but I haven't had a chance to talk to him. What do you mean you haven't talked to him? He's practically your boyfriend. I frowned at the disapproval in her voice. He's not my boyfriend. We're still just dating, kind of. Okay, semantics, whatever. But don't you think you should have called him? I'm not sure if it was because I thought she was being nosy or because on some level I agreed with her. But the direction of the conversation bothered me. I tried laughing it off. Are you lecturing me about my boyfriend choices? I just... He's a great guy, Merritt, and you guys seem to have a great time together. I just don't want you to pass that up for... For... I didn't need to prompt her, didn't need to ask it. I knew exactly what she meant, exactly whom she was referring to. And while I knew she cared about me as much as anyone did, the comment pricked a lot. Merritt, she said, my name apparently standing in for the one she didn't want to say aloud. Mallory, I'm really not in the mood for this right now. Because you have to run off and play with Ethan? Were we doing this? I thought to myself. My best friend and I were actually going to have this argument? I'm doing what I have to do. He's manipulating you into spending time with him. That's not true, Mallory. He hardly even likes me. We're just trying to deal with this rave problem right now. Don't make excuses for him. Ire rising, vampire rising, I kicked my closet door closed with enough force to rattle a silver-framed picture of Mallory and me that sat on the top of the bureau next to it. You know I'm not Ethan's biggest fan. But let's face facts. I'd be in the ground if it wasn't for him. And for better or worse, he's my boss. I really don't have a lot of room to maneuver on this. Fine, deal with Ethan on your own terms, but at least be honest about Morgan. What's that supposed to mean? Merritt, if you don't like Morgan, then fine, break it off. But you don't need to lead him on. It's not fair. He's a good guy, and he deserves better than that. I made a sound that was equal parts shock and hurt. I'm leading him on? That's a really shitty thing to say. You need to make up your mind. And you need to mind your own business. I heard the sharp intake of breath, knew that I'd hurt her. I immediately regretted it, but I was too angry, too tired of having no control over my body, my life, my time, to apologize. She'd hurt me, and I slapped back. We need to end this conversation before we say something we're going to regret, I quietly said. I've got enough to deal with, not to mention the fact that I have to be at my father's in a couple of hours. You know what, Merritt? If your dating life isn't my business, then your daddy issues aren't either. I couldn't speak, couldn't fathom how to respond to that, and even if I'd wanted to, emotion tightened my throat. Maybe it's the genetics, she continued, apparently unwilling to abandon the argument. Maybe it's the person he's asking you to be. We both have different lives now, bigger lives than we did a few months ago. But the merit I knew wouldn't push this boy away. Not this boy. Think about that. The phone went dead. The windshield wiper slapped against the glass as I drove, the summer night wet and humid, fast-moving clouds whipping through the sky below, a darker, ominous mass that pulsated with branching threads of lightning. I parked directly in front of the architecturally austere building that held the gym where I trained with Catcher, and ran inside to avoid the falling rain. Catcher was already there. He stood in the middle of the blue gymnastics mat that filled the training room, wearing a t-shirt and warm-up pants, 
His head was bowed, eyes closed, hands pressed together prayerfully. Take a seat, he said, without opening his eyes. Good evening to you too, Sensei. He opened a single eye, and the look he gave me left no doubt about how unfunny he'd found the retort. Take a seat, Merit. This time his words were biting. I arched a brow back at him, but stripped off my track jacket and took a seat in one of the orange plastic chairs near the door. Catcher remained in his pose of quiet concentration for a few minutes, finally rolling his shoulders and opening his eyes. Done with meditation? I lightly asked. He didn't respond, but strode forcefully toward me, enough malevolence in his gaze to speed my heart. Is there a problem? I asked him. Shut it. Excuse me? Shut it. Catcher stepped before me, pulled a hand across his jaw, then put his hands on the arms of the chair. He leaned forward, his torso arched over mine. I hunched back into the chair. She is my top priority. I didn't need to ask who she was. Obviously Mal had called Catcher. She is unhappy. He paused, pale green eyes tracking back and forth across my face. She's having a difficult time. And I get that you're having a difficult time, Merritt. Jesus knows we all get it. You had problems adjusting to the transition from human to vampire. And now you appear to have trouble remembering your humanity. He leaned incrementally forward. My heart began to thud, warmth flowing through my body as anxiety and adrenaline pulled the vampire from slumber, pushed her closer to the surface. Not now, I begged her. Not now. He'd see, he'd know, and he'd handle me. Nothing good could come from that. For a split second, I thought he knew his brow knitting as he leaned over me. I closed my eyes, counted backward, tried to push her down even as I felt him above me, the bulk of his body perched over my chair, the faint sizzle of latent magic electrifying the air. Slowly, one drop at a time, I felt her recede. She's having trouble adjusting, Merritt, just like you did. And she was there for you. It's time for you to be there for her. Cut her a little slack. I know she said some regrettable things. And believe me, she knows it. I opened my eyes, kept my gaze on his t-shirt, and nodded a little. With a creak of plastic, he straightened, took a step backward, and looked down at me, arms crossed. This time, his expression bore a hint of sympathy. His voice was softer, too. I know you're trying to help Ethan, trying to get him access trying to do your job. I get that. And maybe that's the problem here. Maybe it isn't. Frankly, that's your business, not mine. But before you alienate everyone who cares about you, Mallory or Morgan or whoever, remember who you were before this happened, before you were changed. Try to find some balance. Try to find a place in your life for the things that mattered before he changed you. He started to turn away but apparently thought better of it. I know you have limited time today, but you better be willing to bust your ass. If you're going to stand sentinel, then you damn well better be prepared for it. I shook my head, irritated that he'd assumed it was a lack of effort, of trying, that kept me from being the fighter he really wanted, when, in fact, it was the opposite. You don't get it, I told him. His eyebrows lifted, surprise obvious on his face. Then enlighten me. I looked at him, and for a long, quiet moment I nearly did tell him. I nearly trusted him, trusted myself enough to ask him about it, to tell him that I was broken, that my vampire was broken, separate somehow. But I couldn't bring myself to do it. I'd tried to broach the subject once. He'd shaken off my concern. So I shook my head, lowered it. I don't know what you know, he said, or what you've seen, or what you think you've done, but I advise you to find someone you can trust and spill those beans. Capiche? Silently, I nodded. Then let's get back to work. We did. He wouldn't allow me to spar, given what he deemed my subpar effort two days ago. 
It was a punishment in his eyes, but a moral victory for me, allowing me to put my effort into movement and speed rather than holding back the predatory instinct that threatened to overwhelm me. And besides, since we hadn't been sparring, and thus didn't risk damaging the blades, he let me practice with my katana. We worked through the first seven katas for nearly an hour, while the movements of each kata lasted only a few seconds. Catcher made me repeat the steps, over and over and over again, until he was satisfied with my performance. Until the moves became rote, until my movements were mechanically precise, until I could move so quickly through them that the gestures were blurred by speed. That fast, the katas lost some of their tradition, but they made up for it in dance. Unfortunately, as Catcher pointed out, if I needed to use a sword in a fight, it would likely be against a vampire who was moving as quickly as I was. After he taught me the basic movements of a second set of katas, these using only one hand on the sword, he released me. I'm seeing some improvement, he said, when we'd settled on the blue mat, a spread of katana cleaning implements before us. Thanks, I told him, sliding a piece of rice paper along the sword's sharpened edge. The interesting question is, why don't I see the same kind of effort when you're sparring? I glanced over at him, saw that his gaze was still on his sword. He clearly didn't understand that I'd been working double time to help him and I'd already decided not to tell him, so I didn't answer the question. We were silent for a moment, both of us wiping down our blades, me refusing to answer. No answer, he finally asked. I shook my head. You're as stubborn as she is, I swear to God. Without comment, although I agreed, I slid my sword into its sheath. Chapter 15 I could have danced all night. Back at the house, I showered and arranged undergarments, then slipped on my thigh holster and strappy heels. I opted for an updo tonight, twisting my hair into a knot at the back of my neck. All the basics accomplished, I slithered carefully into the dress. Short timing or not, the fit was exquisite. The dress was exquisite. Pale skin, dark hair, glossy lips, black dress. I looked like an exotic princess, a vampire princess. But the lingering sting of my fight with Mallory lessened a little of the fairy tale. As ready as I could be, I grabbed my clutch and scabbard and went downstairs, where Mallory's devil waited. He stood in the foyer, hands in his pockets, lean body clad in a tuxedo, black, crisply shouldered, a perfect bow tie at his neck. His hair was down, the gold of it straight around his face, highlighting cruelly perfect cheekbones, emerald eyes. He was almost too handsome, untouchably handsome, the face of a god, or something altogether more wicked. What's wrong? he asked without looking up. I reached the first floor, shook my head. I'd rather not talk about it. That lifted his gaze his lips parting infinitesimally as he took in the waterfall silk. That's a lovely dress. His voice was soft, somehow that much more intensely masculine. I nodded, ignoring the undertone. Are we ready? Ethan tilted his head to the side. Are you ready? Let's just go. Ethan paused, then nodded and headed for the stairs. He let me be silent for most of the ride to Oak Park, which was considerably faster than the trip to the Breckenridge estate. But while he didn't talk, he kept turning to look at me, casting worried, surreptitious glances at my face, and a few more lascivious ones at other parts of my anatomy. I noticed them, but ignored them. In the quiet of the car, my thoughts kept going back to my conversation with Mallory. Was I forgetting who I'd been? My life before Catagon House? I'd known Mal for three years. Sure, we had a spat or two along the way. We'd been roommates, after all. But never something like this. Never an argument where we question the other's choices, where we question our roles in each other's lives. This was different. And it was, I feared, 
the harbinger of unfortunate things, of the slow dissolution of a friendship already weakened by physical separation, new ties, supernatural disasters. What happened? Since Ethan's question was softly spoken, and I thought sincere, I answered it. Mallory and I had a fight. About you, I silently added, then said aloud, Suffice it to say, she's not happy with the person, the vampire, I'm becoming. I see. He sounded as uncomfortable as you might expect a boy, even a 400-year-old boy, to sound. I skipped a responsive nod, fearing that the movement would trip the tears, smear my mascara, and leave track marks down my face. I really, really wasn't in the mood for this, not to go to Oak Park, to play dress-up to be in the same room as my father, to pretend at being that girl. I need a motivational speech, I told him. It's been a pretty awful night so far, and I'm fighting the urge to take a cab right back to Cadogan House and spend an intimate evening with a couple of deep-dish meat pies. I could use one of those do-it-for-Cadogan lectures you're so fond of. He chuckled, and the sound of it was comforting somehow. How about I tell you that you look radiant? The compliment was probably the best and worst thing he could have said. Coming from him, it felt weightier, more validating than it should have. And that bothered me. A lot. Scared me. A lot. God, was Mal right? Was I sabotaging my relationship with Morgan for this man? Was I exchanging real friendships, real relationships, for the possibility of Ethan? I felt like I was spiraling around in some kind of vampire whirlpool, the remnants of my normal life draining away. God only knew what would be left of me. How about I remind you, he began, that this is your opportunity to be someone else for a few hours. I understand, maybe better than I did before, that you're different from these people. But tonight you can leave the real merit in Hyde Park. Tonight, you can play make-believe. You can be... The girl they weren't expecting. The girl they weren't expecting. That had kind of a nice ring to it. That's not bad, I told him. And certainly better than the last speech you gave me. He made a master vampire-worthy huff. As master of the house. It's your duty to give me the benefit of the doubt. I finished for him. And to motivate me when you can. I glanced at him. Challenge me, Ethan, if you need to. I understand a challenge. I can rise to it. But work from the assumption that I'm trying, that I'm doing my best. I glanced out the window. That's what I need to hear. He was quiet so long I thought I'd angered him. You are so young, he finally said, poignancy in his voice. Still so very human. I'm not sure if that's a compliment or an insult. Frankly, Merritt, neither am I. Twenty minutes later, we pulled into the circle drive in front of my parents' blocky Oak Park home. The house was a stylistic orphan, completely different from the prairie-style, right homage houses around it. But my parents had enough sway over Chicago's political administration to get the plans approved. So here it sat, a rectangular box of pasty gray concrete in the middle of picturesque Oak Park. Ethan stopped the Mercedes in front of the door and handed the keys to one of the ubiquitous valets that apparently haunted these kinds of galas. The architecture is... interesting, he said. It's atrocious, I replied, but the food's usually pretty good. I didn't bother knocking at the front door nor did I wait to get an invitation into the house. Like it or not, this was my ancestral home. I figured I didn't need an invitation. More importantly, I hadn't bothered on my first trip back to the house shortly after I'd been changed. And here I was, the prodigal daughter, making her return. Penny Baker, the butler, stood just inside the concrete and glass foyer his skinny, stiff frame bowing at each passing guest. His nose lifted indignantly when I approached him. Peabody, I said in greeting, 
I loved faking him out. Penny Baker, he corrected in a growl. Your father is currently in a meeting. Mrs. Merritt and Miss Corkberger are entertaining the guests. He slid his steely gaze to Ethan and arched an eyebrow. This is Ethan Sullivan, I interjected. My guest, he's welcome. Penny Baker nodded dismissively, then looked back to the guests behind us. That hurdle passed, I led Ethan away and began the trek toward the long concrete space at the back of the first floor where my parents entertained. Along the way, bare angular hallways terminated in dead ends. Steel mesh blinds covered not windows, but bare concrete walls. One stairway led to nothing but an alcove showcasing a single piece of modern art that would have been well suited to the living room of a maniacal serial killer. My parents called the design thought-provoking and claimed it was a challenge to the architectural mainstream, to people's expectations of what stairways and windows were supposed to be. I called the design contemporary psychopath. The space was packed with people in black and white clothing, and a jazz quintet provided a soundtrack from one of the room's corners. I glanced around looking for targets. There were no Breckenridges in sight, and my father was equally absent. Not that that was a bad thing, but I found something just as interesting near the bank of windows that edged one side of the room. Prepare yourself, I warned him with a grin, and led him into the fray. They stood together, my mother and sister, eyes scanning the crowd before them, heads together as they gossiped, and there was no doubt they gossiped. My mother was one of the ruling matrons of Chicago society. My sister, an up-and-coming princess. Gossip was their bread and butter. My mother wore a conservative gown of pale gold, a sheath and bolero jacket well suited for her trim frame. My sister, her hair as dark as mine, wore a pale blue sleeveless cocktail dress. Her hair was pulled back a thin, glossy black headband keeping every dark strand in place. And in her arms, currently chewing on her tiny, pudgy fist, was one of the lights of my life, my niece, Olivia. Hi, Mom, I said. My mother turned, frowned, and touched fingers to my cheek. You look thin. Are you eating? More than I've ever eaten in my life. It's glorious. I gave Charlotte a half hug. Mrs. Corkberger, if you think that having my daughter in my arms will prevent me from swearing at you, Charlotte said, you are sorely mistaken. Without batting an eyelash, and without explaining why she planned on swearing at me, she passed over my eighteen-month-old niece and the nubby burp cloth that rested on her shoulder. Meow, 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 Olivia gleefully sang, hands clapping as I took her in my arms. I was pretty sure she was singing my name. Olivia, having missed out on the dark-haired Merritt Jean, was blonde as her father, Major Corkberger, with a halo of curls around her angelic face and bright blue eyes. She was wearing her party best, a sleeveless pale blue dress the same color as Charlotte's, with a wide blue satin ribbon around the waist. And, by the way, yes... My brother-in-law's given name really was Major Corkberger. But for the fact that he was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed former college quarterback, I'd have assumed he got the crap beat out of him in high school on a daily basis for that one. Nevertheless, I rarely failed to remind him that he was, in fact, a Major Corkberger. I don't think he thought that was funny. Why are you going to swear at me? I asked Charlotte, once I'd arranged Olivia and placed the cloth prophylactically on my shoulder. First things first, she said, eyes on Ethan. We haven't been introduced. Oh, Mom, Charlotte, this is Ethan Sullivan. Mrs. Merritt, Ethan said, kissing my mother's hand. Mrs. Corkberger. He did the same to my sister, who nibbled the edge of her lip. One eyebrow arched in obvious pleasure. It is just lovely to meet you, Charlotte intoned, then crossed her arms. And how have you been treating my little sister? Ethan snuck a glance my way. Don't look at me, I silently told him, assuming he could hear me.
This was your idea. You got yourself into it, so you can get yourself out. I couldn't hold back a grin. Ethan rolled his eyes, but seemed amused. Merit is a very unique vampire. She has a certain... We all leaned forward a little, eager to catch the verdict. Star quality. He looked at me when he said it, a hint of pride in his emerald green eyes. I was stunned enough that I couldn't quite manage to get out a thank you, but there must have been sufficient shock in my eyes that he couldn't have missed it. You have a lovely home, Mrs. Merritt. Ethan lied to my mother. She thanked him, and the conversation about the benefits and disadvantages of living in an architectural masterpiece began. I figured that gave me at least ten or fifteen minutes to catch up with Charlotte. Charlotte looked at him with approval, then smiled smartly at me. He is delish. Tell me you've hit that. Ugh, I have not hit that, nor do I plan to. He's trouble in a very pretty package. Head tilted, she gave Ethan's body a complete scan. Very pretty package indeed. I'm thinking he might be worth the trouble, little sister. She looked back at me, then frowned. Now, what's going on with you and Daddy? You're fighting, and then you're a vampire, and then you're still fighting, and now all of a sudden you're here, at a party, in a dress. It's complicated was my admittedly weak retort. You two need to sit down and hash some things out. I'm here, aren't I? She didn't need to know exactly how much I dreaded it. And as for the fighting, he's threatened to disinherit me twice in the last month. He threatens to disinherit everyone? You know how he is. You've known for 28 years. He hasn't threatened Robert, I pointed out, my voice sounding every bit the petulant little sister. Well, obviously not Robert, Charlotte dryly agreed, reaching out to straighten the hem of Olivia's dress. Dearest Robert can do no wrong. And speaking of family drama, did I get a phone call to tell me my baby sister was a vampire? No. I had to find out from Daddy. She flicked the tip of my ear with her thumb and index finger. I guess that explained why she wanted to swear at me. Hey, I said, covering an ear with my non-baby cradling hand. That wasn't funny when I was twelve, and it's not funny now. Act your age, and I'll act mine, she said. I am acting my age. All evidence to the contrary, she muttered. Just do me a favor, okay? What? Just try, for me, for better or worse, he's the only father you've got and you're the only immortal merit, as far as I'm aware anyway. I don't think dearest Robert has acquired immortality yet, but that might only require a few dollars pressed into the right hands. I smiled and relaxed a little. Charlotte and I weren't close, but I could appreciate her hands-on approach to sarcasm. And, of course, we shared a heady dose of sibling rivalry with Robert. About that immortality thing, she said. Maybe now is the time for you and Daddy to mend some fences. My eyes widened at the sudden seriousness in her voice. You'll be here longer than the rest of us, she said. You'll be alive long after we're gone, after I'm gone. You'll watch my children and my grandchildren grow up. You'll watch them, and you'll watch over them. And that's your responsibility, Merritt. I know you have your duties to your house. I've learned enough in the last two months to understand that but you're also a merit, for better or for worse. You have the ability, you're the only one of us who does, to keep them safe. She let out a haggard sigh, a motherly sigh, and settled serious eyes on her daughter, tugging again at her dress. I wasn't sure if it was a nervous movement, something to do with her hands, or just the simple comforting act of touching her child. There are crazy people in the world, she continued. Being a vampire certainly doesn't inoculate against crazy. They say, what was her name? No need to ask who she meant. Selena. Selena. They say she's been confined. But how would we know that? She turned her gaze back on me, and I saw a mother's concern and a mother's suspicion in her eyes. She may have wondered if Selena had been released, but she didn't know my father, apparently, had kept his word 
and hadn't revealed what Ethan had told him. I could have spilled the beans to Charlotte, told her things that would frighten her further, things that would impress upon her the need to keep her family close, to keep them safe. Instead, I kept the burden in my hands. It's taken care of, I said simply. It wasn't, of course, taken care of. Selena was out there somewhere. She knew where I was. And she probably wasn't above going after my family to show how irritated she was with me. I assumed that's what I was to her, an irritation, an unfinished project. But if I could swear two oaths to a stranger in front of a house full of strangers, I could swear a silent one to Charlotte that I would watch over Olivia and her older brothers and sister. And if I stayed alive long enough, over their children. I could promise that I would stand sentinel for the family that had given me my name, just as I would for the family I'd given a name for. It's taken care of, I repeated, meaning it, instilling my voice with the sincerity of belief that I'd take a stake before I'd let anything happen to Olivia. She looked at me for a long, quiet time, then nodded, our understanding reached, the deal done. P.S. That dress is foul. Startled by both the abrupt change in conversation and the comment, I shifted Olivia's weight to the side to look down at my dress. Charlotte shook her head. Not yours, Lucy Cabot's. She pointed into the crowd at a woman draped in a polka-dotted tent of organza. Horrendous. No, yours is lovely. I saw it at Fashion Week. Can't remember who designed it. Bagley? I forget. Regardless, your stylist did good. She cast a sly glance back at Ethan, who was chatting up my mother. And your accessories are fabulous. He's not my accessory, I reminded her. He's my boss. He's fine is what he is. He could sexually harass me any day. I glanced down at the youngest Corkburger, who blinked wide eyes at me as she gnawed at the end of her burp cloth. Earmuffs much? Murph, Olivia said. I wasn't sure if that was gas or an attempt to mimic my words. I bet the latter. Olivia adored me. Honey, Charlotte said, it's the 21st century. Vampires are chic. The cubs have a pennant. And it's perfectly acceptable for a woman to find a man attractive. These are all things my daughter needs to know about. Especially the cubs part, I said waving the burp cloth at Olivia to her joyful cheers. She clapped her hands with the slow awkwardness and simple glee of a child. If you could live at Wright and Addison, you would, Charlotte predicted. This is true. I do love my cubbies. And so often for naught, she smirked, then clapped her hands and held them out to Olivia, who bounced in my arms and leaned toward her mother, holding out her own hands. It's been lovely catching up, sister, but I need to get this one home and into bed. Major's home with the rest of the troops. I just wanted to have a chance to say hi and let you visit your favorite niece. I love all your children equally, I protested, passing back the heavy, warm bundle of baby. Charlotte snickered and balanced Olivia on her hip. I'm going to be a good mommy and pretend that's true, whether it is or not. As long as you love my children more than Robert's, we're good. She leaned in, pressed a kiss against my cheek. Night, little sister. And by the way, if you have a chance with Blondie, take it. Please. For me. The lascivious look she cast in Ethan's direction when she pulled back left little doubt about what chance she meant me to take. Good night, Char, my love to Major. Good night, Livy. Now, she cried bouncing on her mother's hip, but the night had apparently taken its toll, and her blonde head dropped to Charlotte's shoulder, her eyelids slowly closing. She fought it, I could tell, tried to keep her eyes open and her gaze on the dresses and partygoers around her. But when she popped a thumb into her mouth, I knew she was done. Her lids fell shut and this time stayed there. Charlotte said her goodbyes to Ethan, managing not to wrap manicured fingers around his ass, and my mother excused herself to see the rest of her guests. You're wearing a very serious expression, Ethan said, reaching my side again. I was reminded that I owe certain obligations to my family, 
There are services I can provide. Because of your immortality. I nodded. It does impose a sense of obligation to one's family and friends, he agreed. Just be careful that you don't give in to the guilt of it. That you have been given a gift, even if others cannot share in it, does not diminish its value. Live your life, Merit, the many years of it, and be grateful. Has that attitude worked for you? Some days better than others, he admitted, then glanced at me. I assume you'll need feeding soon. I'm a girl, not a pet. But, realistically, I pretty much always do. I pressed a hand to the thin black silk above my stomach. Are you always hungry? I am always hungry. Did you eat breakfast? I had part of a granola bar before training. Ethan rolled his eyes. That might explain something, he said, but beckoned a waitress in our direction. The young woman, who couldn't have been more than eighteen, was dressed, like all the waiters, in head-to-toe black. She was pale, and a flow of straight red hair spilled across her shoulders. When she reached us, she extended a square ceramic tray loaded with hors d'oeuvres toward Ethan. What have we got? I asked, eyes scanning the platter. I hope there's something with bacon, or prosciutto. I'd take anything cured or smoked. You're Ethan, right? I lifted my gaze from what looked like prosciutto-wrapped asparagus, score, and found the waitress, her bright blue eyes big as saucers, gazing dreamily at Ethan. I am, yes, he answered. That's just, that's just great, she said, her cheeks mottled with crimson. Are you, you're like a master vampire, right? The head of Catagon House? Um, yes, I am. That's just... Wow. We stood there for a moment, the waitress, lips parted, blinking doe eyes at Ethan, and Ethan, much to my amusement, shifting his feet uncomfortably. How about we'll just take that, he finally said, pulling the tray carefully from her outstretched hands, and thank you for bringing it. Oh, no, thank you she said, grinning dopily at him. You're just, that's just, great, she said again, then turned to skip away through the crowd. I believe you have a fan, I told him, biting back a snicker. He gave me a sardonic look, offered his tray. Dinner? Seriously, you have a fan, girl. How bizarre. And yes, thank you. I looked over the offerings, hand poised above the tray and settled on a wooden toothpick staked cube of beef, accompanied by a greenish sauce. As a vampire, I didn't care for the staked meat analogy, but I wasn't going to turn down what was probably a choice cut. I'm not sure if your shock about my having a human fan is insulting or not. Much like everything else about me, it's endearing. I popped the beef into my mouth. It was delicious, so I scanned the tray prepared for a second dive, and nabbed a pastry cup full of a spinach concoction. It was also delicious. Say what you wanted about my father, and I mean that literally, be my guest. But the man had good taste in caterers. You'd find no whip shellfish at a Joshua Merritt party. Would you like me to give you a few minutes with the tray? I glanced up at Ethan, my fingers poised over another beef cube, and grinned. Could you just, we'd really like to be alone right now? I think that means you've had enough, he said, turning away and setting the tray on a nearby side table. Did you just cut me off? Come with me. I arched a brow at him. You can't order me around in my own house, Sullivan. Ethan's gaze dropped to the metal at my neck. This is hardly your house any longer, Sentinel. I made a sound of disagreement, but when he turned and walked away, I followed. He strolled across the room like he owned it, like there was nothing unusual about a master vampire sauntering through a crowd of Windy City bigwigs. Maybe, in this day and age, there wasn't. With those cheekbones, that sleek tux, and the unmistakable air of power and entitlement, he looked like he belonged. We reached a gap in the crowd, and Ethan stopped, turned, and held out a hand. 
I stared at it blankly, then lifted my gaze to his. Oh no, this is not part of my assignment. You're a ballet dancer. Was a ballet dancer, I reminded him. I glanced around and saw the multitude of eyes on us, then leaned toward him. I am not going to dance with you, I whispered, but fiercely. Dancing is not part of my job description. It's one dance, Sentinel, and this is not a request. It's an order. If they see us dancing, perhaps they'll adjust to our presence a bit faster. Perhaps it will soften them up. The excuse was hokey, but I could hear the mumbles of the people around us, who were wondering why I was standing there, why I hadn't yet accepted his hand. I had the strangest sense of deja vu. On the other hand, I was at home, which meant a meeting with my father was imminent. My stomach was beginning to knot. I needed something to keep my mind off of it, and dancing with a ridiculously handsome, if often infuriating, master vampire would probably do the trick. You owe me, I muttered, but took his hand, just as the quintet began to play. I could have danced all night. I slid a glance to the members of the quintet, who grinned like they'd made their very first vampire joke. And maybe they had. Thank you, I mouthed to them, and they nodded back at me in unison. Your father hired comedians, Ethan commented, as he led me to a spot in the middle of the empty floor. He stopped and turned, and I placed my free hand on his shoulder. His free hand, the one that wasn't clutching mine, went to the back of my waist. He put pressure there, pulling me closer. Not quite, but almost against the line of his body. His body around mine, it was hard to avoid the scent of his cologne. Clean, crisp, irritatingly delicious. I swallowed. Maybe this hadn't been such a good idea. On the other hand, best thing to do was to keep the mood light. He has to pay people who have a sense of humor, since he's lacking one. I added, when Ethan didn't laugh. I understood the joke, Merritt, he quietly said, sparkling emerald eyes on me as we began to sway. I didn't find it funny. Yes, well, your sense of humor leaves something to be desired. Ethan spun me out and away, then pulled me back again. Stuck up or not, I had to give him props. The boy could move. My sense of humor is perfectly well developed he informed me when our bodies aligned again. I merely have high standards. And yet you deign to dance with me. I'm dancing in a stately home with the owner's daughter, who happens to be a powerful vampire. Ethan looked down at me, brow cocked. A man could do worse. A man could do worse, I agreed. But could a vampire? If I find one, I'll ask him. The response was corny enough that I laughed aloud, full and heartily, and had the odd, heart-clenching pleasure of watching him smile back, watching his green eyes shine with the delight of it. No, I told myself, even as we danced, even as he smiled down at me, even as his hand at my waist, the warm weight of it felt natural. I looked away, saw that the people around us watched us dance with obvious curiosity. But there was something else in their expressions, a kind of sweetness, like they were watching a couple's first wedding waltz. I realized how it must look, Ethan, blonde and handsome in his tuxedo, me in my black silk ball gown, two vampires, one of whom was the daughter of the host, a girl who disappeared from society only to reemerge with this handsome man on her arm. Locked together, smiling as they shared a dance, the first couple to take the floor. If we'd actually been dating and had wanted to announce our relationship, we couldn't have staged it better. My smile fell away. What had felt like a novelty, dancing with the vampire in my father's house, began to feel like a ridiculous theatrical production. He must have seen the change in my expression when I looked back at him. His smile had melted. We shouldn't be doing this. Why, he asked, should we not be dancing? It's not real. It could be. I snapped my gaze to meet his. There was desire in his eyes, and while I wasn't naive enough to deny the chemistry between us, 
Our relationship was complicated enough between Sentinel and Master. Dating wasn't going to make things easier. You think too much, Ethan quietly said, approbation in his voice. I looked away at the couples finally beginning to join us on the dance floor. You train me to think, Ethan. To always think, strategize, plan. To evaluate the consequences of my actions. I shook my head. For what you're suggesting? No. There would be too many consequences. Silence. Touché, he finally whispered. I nodded almost imperceptibly and took the point. Chapter 16 An Offer They Can't Refuse We'd eaten, danced, and sipped champagne for nearly an hour and still saw no sign of my father or the Breckenridges. It was hard to play Nancy Drew without evidence. When I caught the interested rise of Ethan's brows, I looked automatically in the direction of his gaze, expecting to see Joshua Merritt nearby. But instead of my father, in the midst of a circle of laughing men, stood the mayor. At thirty-six, Seth Tate was in the beginning of his second term. He'd named himself a reformer, but hadn't been able to produce the economic renaissance he'd promised when campaigning against the Potter political machine that had ruled Chicago before his election. He'd also given my grandfather his position as ombud, thereby officially opening the city's administration and enforcement wings to Chicago SUPs. Tate was tall and surprisingly fit for a man who evaluated policy all day. He was also almost ridiculously handsome. He had the face of a rebellious angel, black hair, crystal blue eyes, perfect mouth, and a patented bad boy brood that no doubt made him the fantasy of more than one woman in the Windy City. He'd been named America's Sexiest Politician, his face splashed on the covers of more than one news magazine. Despite the press, Tate was still single, but it was rumored he'd installed mistresses in a sprinkling of Chicago land neighborhoods. None, as far as I was aware, were vampires. Although, having seen the voluptuous nymphs that ruled the segments of the Chicago River, it wouldn't have surprised me if he'd slipped one of them into his rotation. I looked back at Ethan, his gaze on Tate, and saw a strange look of covetousness on his face. That's when the gears clicked into place. I knew Ethan wanted access to my father and those of his ilk. Our attempt to keep the raves out of the press was a handy means toward building that connection. But the raves and the story aside, Ethan wanted access to Tate. Access that Tate hadn't, at least until now, been willing to provide. You should say hello to our young mayor, Ethan said. I've already said hello, I said. I'd met Tate twice before. That had been plenty. Yes, Ethan said. I know that. Slowly, I slid him a glance, my eyebrows raised. You know that? Ethan sipped his champagne. You know that Luke researches his guards, Merritt, and that he did his background on you. I reviewed that background, and I can read the Tribune as well as anyone. I should have known. I should have known they'd have found the article, and I should have known Luke would have given it to Ethan. I'd been home for a long weekend during my junior year at NYU. My parents got tickets to the Joffrey Ballet, and we'd run into Tate outside the theater, where a Trib reporter snapped a shot of Tate and me, shaking hands. That's not the kind of thing that would have normally been picture-worthy, except for the fact that it almost perfectly mirrored a Trib picture of us from six years earlier. The first time around, I'd been fourteen with a bit part in a big ballet production. Tate had been a young alderman at the time, two years into law school. Probably to make inroads with my father, he'd delivered flowers to me after the performance. I'd still been in costume, leotard, tutu, point shoes and tights, and the photographer caught him in the middle of handing over a paper-wrapped bouquet of white roses. The Triv reporter who caught us at the Joffrey's performance apparently liked the symbolism, and both shots ended up, side by side, on the local news page. I suppose I couldn't fault Ethan for thinking ahead, 
for milking every drop of opportunity, but it stung to play middleman again. Humans are not the only political animals, I muttered. Brows lifted, Ethan glanced over at me. Is that a review of my tactics, Sentinel? Shaking my head, I looked back at the crowd and surprisingly found appraising blue eyes on me. I smiled slyly. Why no, Sullivan? If you have the perfect weapon, you might as well use it. Pardon me? Let's see how well I can act, shall we? Before he could ask what I meant to do, I put on my brightest Merritt family smile, straightened my spine, and sauntered over to the mayor's throng. His gaze following me as I moved, Tate nodded absently to those around him, then steered his way through the crowd and toward me, two men in stiff suits behind him. The entourage was not a turn-on, but I appreciated his decisiveness. Tate didn't stop until he reached me, blue eyes sparkling, dimples perked at the corners of his mouth. Political upstart or not, he was undeniably attractive. We met in the middle of the room, and I guessed, given his quick glance behind me, that Ethan had followed me. Ballerina, he whispered, taking the hands I held out to him. Mr. Mayor. Tate squeezed my hands. When he leaned forward, pressing his lips to my cheek, a lock of soft, dark hair, worn a little longer than generally thought appropriate by Chicago's more conservative voters, brushed my cheek. Tate smelled like lemon and sunshine and sugar, a weirdly ethereal combination for a city administrator, but delicious all the same. It's been too long, he whispered, and a shiver trickled up my spine. When he pulled back, I glanced behind me, saw enough fire in Ethan's emerald eyes to feel vindicated, and indicated him with a negligent hand. Ethan Sullivan, my master. Tate was still smiling, but the smile didn't quite reach his eyes. He'd been excited to see me, for reasons lascivious or otherwise. He was clearly less excited to meet Ethan. Perhaps he had been avoiding encounters with the city's masters, and here I'd gone and forced it. On the other hand, there was no way my father wouldn't have mentioned that we were planning to attend the party. That was information he wouldn't have been able to keep to himself. That was warning enough for Tate, I decided. Ethan stepped forward, beside me, and Tate reached out a stiff hand. Ethan, glad to finally meet you. Liar, liar, I thought, but watched the interaction with fascination. They shook hands. It's an honor to finally meet you, Mr. Mayor. Tate took a step back, gave me an obvious perusal the grin on his face softening a look that would have otherwise felt completely demeaning, and, as it was, felt only forty to fifty percent demeaning. Bad boy or not, he was awfully pretty. I haven't seen you in years, Tate said, not since the last Tribune picture. He smiled charmingly. I believe you're right. He nodded. I'd heard you'd move back to Chicago to work on your doctorate. Your father was so proud of your academic accomplishments. That was news to me. I was sorry to hear that you'd... halted your academic studies. Tate slid a glance in Ethan's direction. Since I'd halted my studies only because Ethan had made me a vampire, the shot at Ethan was completely unsubtle and, frankly, a little surprising. Did Tate assume animosity between us? Or was he simply trying to create it, to drive a wedge? While I admittedly enjoyed tweaking Ethan, I was still on his side, and I wasn't naive enough to think that biting the hand that fed me was a good idea, even to flatter the mayor. I believe the immortality more than makes up for the diploma, I told Tate. Well, he said, not hiding his surprise. I see. Apparently even the mayor isn't always in the know. I appreciated that he took the hit, that he could recognize that his intel about the supposed animosity between me and Ethan, from whatever sources, hadn't been entirely correct. Nor, to be honest, was it entirely incorrect. I wanted to thank you, I told him, 
changing the subject, for the trust you put in my grandfather. I glanced around, thinking it best to limit what I said about my grandfather's position in mixed company and in my father's house. As far as I knew, my father knew nothing about my grandfather's duties as the umbud. I planned to keep it that way. Without getting into the details, given that this is neither the time nor the place for that kind of discussion, I prefaced, and Tate nodded his understanding. He's glad he's able to stay busy, to help, and I'm glad to know I have someone in my corner. All of us are. Tate nodded like you'd expect a campaigning politician might, seriousness and gravity in his expression. We're on the same page there. You, all of you, deserve a voice in Chicago. One of Tate's body men leaned toward him. The mayor listened for a moment, then nodded. I'm sorry to leave you, he told me, his lips curled into a melancholy smile. But I need to get to a meeting. He reached a hand out to Ethan. I'm glad we were finally able to connect. We should put aside some time to talk. That would be appreciated, Mr. Mayor. Ethan agreed, nodding. Tate looked at me again, opened his mouth to speak, but then seemed to think better of it. He put his hands on my upper arms, leaned toward me, and pressed his lips against my cheek. Then he shifted, his lips at my ear. When you can get away, get in touch. Call my office. They'll put you through, day or night. The day part of that was superfluous, given my little sunlight problem. The rest of it, the fact that he'd requested a meeting from me, not Ethan, and the access he'd just granted, was surprising. But I nodded at him when he pulled back. Good evening, he said, with a half bow to both of us. One of his guards stepped before him and began to tunnel through the crowd. Tate followed into the space he'd made, a second guard behind him. He wants me to call him, I tattled, when the crowd had reformed around us. He told me to get in touch, any time, that his office would put me through. I glanced up at Ethan. What could that be about? Ethan frowned down at me. I have no clue. He kept staring at me, one eyebrow arching into obvious disapproval. Why the long face? Is there anyone who isn't infatuated with you? I smiled at him, with teeth. If not, it's because you haven't assigned them to me yet. Matahari at your service. Would you like to add him to the list? I don't appreciate your sarcasm. I don't appreciate being handed out like a party favor. A muscle in his jaw ticked. What would you like me to say to that? I opened my mouth to give an answer just as snarky as my question, but a silver tray appeared at my elbow, interrupting me. The tray held only a small white card. Joshua Merritt was printed in neat block letters across it. My heart skipped a discomforting beat, those six square inches of cardstock eliciting the same sense of dreadful anticipation they had when I was a child. My father had wanted peace and quiet and perfection, and on those occasions when he sought an audience with me for some failing in one of those categories, this is how he'd done it. I reached out and picked up the card, then glanced at Penny Baker, who delivered it. Your father will see you in his office, he said with a bob of his head, then disappeared into the crowd. We stood silently for a moment, my gaze on the card in my hand. You're ready, Ethan said, and I understood that statement was meant to be an affirmation. Ready enough, I said. I smoothed the silk at my waist and led him away. My father rose from a black and chrome Mies van der Rohe couch when we slid open the top-mounted, reclaimed wood door. Where Papa Breck's office had been warm and masculine, my father's was cold. It fit right in with the rest of the house's ultra-modern decor. Merritt, Ethan, my father said, waving us inside with a hand. I heard the door slide shut behind us and assumed Penny Baker had attended to it. Merritt, I heard in my head, as I saw what Ethan had no doubt realized and meant to warn me about, that Nicholas and Papa Breck were standing in my father's office. Nick was in jeans, a t-shirt, and a brown corduroy sports jacket. 
Papa Breck, a solidly large, barrel-chested man, was in a tuxedo. They stood together, bodies close and aligned, suspicious eyes on us as we entered. I looked at Nick, tried to ferret out his mood, which didn't take long, given the anger in his eyes, the tightness in his jaw. And when he looked from me to Ethan, took in the dress and the tuxedo, disappointment joined his other expressions. The others were confusing, but the disappointment stung. Papa Breck nodded to me. That nod was apparently the only greeting he could spare for the vampire daughter of his best friend, for his son's former girlfriend. I hadn't seen Michael Breckenridge Sr. in years, but I'd have expected more than a nod, maybe words, some indication of the closeness of our families, the relationship that had existed between me and Nick. I'd practically been a member of that family for all the summer vacations I'd spent at his house, running through the halls, through the grass, along the dirt-lined path to the labyrinth. On the other hand, I suppose I should have considered myself fortunate, as he didn't even spare Ethan a nod. The Breckenridges have received information, my father said, about a threat of violence against their son. The surprise was evident in Ethan's expression. A threat of violence? Don't play coy, Nick muttered. Don't pretend you don't know what we're talking about. Ethan's jaw clenched, and he slipped his hands into his pockets. I am afraid, Nicholas, that we have no idea what you're talking about. We do not threaten violence. We certainly have not issued a threat of violence against you. Not me, Nicholas said. Jamie. The room went silent, at least until I spoke up. Someone threatened Jamie? What was the threat? I asked. And why would you think it came from us? Nick's gaze slowly shifted to mine, stubbornness in the set of his jaw. Tell me, Nick, I implored him. I can guarantee you we haven't threatened Jamie, but even if we had, you lose nothing from telling us what you've heard. Either we made the threat, so we know what it is already, or we've been framed, and we need to figure out what the hell's going on. Nick glanced back at his father, who nodded, then turned back to us. Before we talked in the garden at my parents, we got a phone call at the house. Unlisted number. She said vampires were interested in Jamie. She, Nick had said. The caller was female. Had it been Selena? Amber? Some other vamp who had it in for the Brex? Or who was itching to stir up trouble for Cadogan House? Today, Nick continued. I got an email. It had specifics, details about exactly how you planned to harm my brother. Ethan frowned, clearly confused. And why do we purportedly want to hurt Jamie? The message didn't say, Nick answered, but the words were a little too quickly spoken to ring true. Maybe he knew about Jamie's story. Maybe there was another reason he thought Jamie might be a target. And that wasn't the only problem with his evidence. How do you know the email was from a Cadogan vamp? I asked. How do you know it wasn't just a hoax? Give me a little credit, Merritt. They gave me information to verify. Ethan and I exchanged a glance. What information? He asked, caution in his tone. Nick looked away, wet his lips, then looked up at me again. There was coldness in his eyes. There were details about you, he said then turn that frigid gaze on Ethan. And you. Together. My cheeks flushed crimson. Ethan, apparently much less worried, made a soft, sardonic sound. Rest assured, Nicholas, we have no plans to harm your brother. And I can most definitely assure you that you are not speaking with a Cadogan vampire. There is no together where Merritt and I are concerned. Not that he hadn't considered it, I thought, remembering our dance. Oh? Nick asked, as if feigning surprise. Then you didn't share a moment in the library Friday night? He turned his gaze on me. I was told that you passed along the story of our meeting in the garden, that you informed your master that I was coming for you. This time my cheeks paled. While his implication was wrong, our moment in the library had been completely platonic. The gossip part was true enough. 
Someone had been in the library, had overheard our conversation. Someone was playing us. And more importantly, someone was betraying Ethan, again. I didn't want to, but I made myself turn and check Ethan's expression. He stood frozen there beside me, jaw clenched, unmitigated fury on his face. We did not, he bit out. Nor have we ever issued a threat against Jamie or any other member of your family. That's not the way my house operates. If such a message was sent to you, it was not sent from a Katagun vampire, and certainly not with my approval. If someone in my house has informed you otherwise, they are sorely mistaken. Despite the gravity in Ethan's tone, Nick's responding shrug was careless. I'm sorry, Sullivan, but that's not good enough. Ethan's brows lifted. Not good enough? We're only asking you not to jump to conclusions, I told Nicholas. That's all. Not to jump to conclusions? Nick took steps, closing the distance between us. I had to steel myself not to step back. How naive are you, Merritt? Or is that some kind of vampire denial talking? Nicholas, Papa Breck said, but Nick shook his head. No, he spat out. I told you that if you tried to harm him, I would come after you with everything I had. I will not stand by while vampires destroy my family, Merritt. Nick, son, Papa Breck repeated, but Nicholas stayed where he was, inches away from me, staring down at me with eyes of furious electric blue. We did not issue a threat against Jamie, Nick. Do not lie to me, Merritt. Nick leaned closer and whispered in a voice that I assumed was only for me. They may give you a dress, and they may give you a sword, but I know who you are. Oh, but I'd enjoy wiping that smirk from his face. I dropped my head, closed my eyes, and let the anger rise enough, just enough, to silver my eyes. I had to clench my fists to hold back the rest of it, to keep my fangs from descending, to keep the vampire asleep and the fight of it kept me quiet for a moment. I was silent long enough to hear shuffling, the rest of the room growing increasingly nervous the longer I kept my head down. I opened my eyes again and slowly lifted my head, gazing at Nick between half-hooded lashes. Predictably, his smile faded, his own eyes widening at the silver in mine. He swallowed, likely at the reminder that I wasn't just a girl he'd known in high school and I wasn't to be bullied to satiate the anger that flowed from whatever prejudices darkened his soul. Nicholas, I began, my voice soft and low and lush. I stand sentinel for a house of three hundred and twenty vampires. I will not strike first. But he allows me to carry a weapon because I know how to use it. Because I will use it. I know my position, my obligation and I will do what is necessary to protect them. Because you and I were friends once, I will warn you once. Step back. Nick stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, his body statue still, until Papa Breck put a hand on his arm and whispered something in his ear. When Nick turned away, strode to the bar my father kept on a concrete table in one corner of the room. I'd have sworn I felt something in his wake something tingly, but I was distracted by the sudden sound of Ethan's voice in my head. There is a traitor in my house, he silently said, again. My heart ached for him, for the betrayal he must have felt for the second time in only a few months, even if it was currently blanketed by a thick, righteous fury. I know, I said back, then promised, I'll find him. Finally, Nick stepped away from his father, a decision apparently made. My father has decided to give you the benefit of the doubt, assuming that you did not make a threat against Jamie. You have 24 hours to find out who did. If you don't contact us within 24 hours with a name and your assurances that the threat has been resolved, I will contact the mayor and inform him that Cadogan House has made a threat against humans, against my family. The phone call will be followed by calls to the Trib, the Sun-Times, and every television station in the metro area. 
I may also have to tell them some other things I know. And then they'll be raving mad, he said, putting the emphasis on the word so we couldn't mistake his meaning. Your so-called celebrity, Nick continued, apparently not yet done with his tirade, is delicate at best. There are plenty of people who think the congressional investigations were a joke, who think you constitute a legitimate threat to humans. There are plenty of people out there who think we'd all be better off if the vampire problem went away. Nick snapped his fingers ominously. Poof! I glanced at Ethan, watched his eyes turn glassy green, and guessed he was struggling to maintain his own control. Still, he managed to keep from silvering his eyes, from descending his fangs. I can't guarantee Jamie's safety from other parties, Ethan finally answered and I can't guarantee resolution of this issue in twenty-four hours, particularly when we will be unconscious for more than half of that time. Nick's expression flattened. Then I suggest you and your soldier here get your asses in gear. Ethan looked down at the floor, then glanced up, but not at Nicholas. Instead, he focused his gaze on Papa Breck. You should consider the possibility that if threats were made against Jamie, they were made for a reason, that he has stepped on one too many toes, or has involved himself in things that do not concern him. If we investigate this matter further, that information might come to light. Are you prepared for that? For answers you'd prefer to keep in-house? I'm not sure what information Ethan was referring to, or if he was merely bluffing, but I had to give him props. It was a good rebuttal. Nicholas opened his mouth to counter Ethan, but his father held out a hand. Nicholas, he warned, then turned to my father. He's my son. I will protect him at all costs. Do we understand each other? Clearly, my father answered. Twenty-four hours, Nick repeated, and began his stride toward the door. I put a hand on Nick's arm to stop him. The contact didn't dissipate the menace in his glare. Is Jamie working right now? His lip curled. I figured he was seconds away from growling at me. I'm not going to hurt him, Nick. You're asking a lot from us, especially when we have nothing to do with any threat against your brother. If you want us to figure it out, give us something in return. When he continued to stare at me, I added in a whisper, Quid pro quo, Nick. Nick wet his lips, then nodded. Investments, he said. Jamie's selling investments. Bingo. Forward the email to me, I told him. Use my old address. He looked at me for a moment before nodding, then went to the door, pushing it to the side with enough force to rattle the industrial hinges. Papa Breck followed him out, without even a glance in our direction. When Pennybaker slid the door shut again, my father and I both looked at Ethan. Is there anything I can do? Ethan shook his head at my father's request. Thank you, Joshua, but no. We'll handle this one internally. I'll call the masters together. If we could just borrow your office for a few minutes longer. Of course, he said, then left us alone. Forward the email to me, Ethan repeated, eyebrows lifted. Jeff Christopher, I reminded him, in my grandfather's office. He's a computer whiz kid. He can help us, and he'll be thrilled to be asked. There was doubt in Ethan's expression. He's a shifter, right? I frowned back. Yeah, why? As I'm sure you've discovered by now, shifters and vampires aren't exactly cozy. Sure, but isn't Gabriel Keane bringing his pack to Chicago? This is the perfect opportunity to make inroads. He considered the idea for a moment, then nodded. Make the call. Ethan massaged his forehead with the fingers of one hand, his gaze on the floor. Jamie is not writing for the Chicago World Weekly. Jamie is selling investments, and although we believed we were the victims here, Nicholas believes that we've issued a threat against Jamie. He lifted his gaze to mine. What do we learn from that? There is no rave story, I concluded.
Or if there is, Nicholas doesn't know about it. He apparently knows about the raves, but that's a red herring. I shook my head. No. Someone's playing us against each other. Ethan nodded his agreement. A woman calls the Breckenridge house the day before we attend a party there and informs the Breckenridges of some vague threat. Nick asks you to meet him in the woods and raises the same issue. Today, before we arrive at another party, information regarding a specific threat is sent directly to Nicholas. They discovered Nick was the point man, I said. Whoever's behind this mess figured out he was the wreck to work through if they wanted to create chaos. Which is exactly what they've succeeded in doing, Ethan muttered. He crossed his arms and walked to one end of the office, then braced his hands on the back of a leather chair. Wait, I said. The information about the story that first came from the Umbud's office, the stuff we talked about with Luke. How did they find out? Anonymous tip, Ethan said. The information was left at the office. Damn, I thought. So much for that lead. Okay, I said. Then why Cadogan? And why the Breckenridges? We've been pitted against each other, although I have no clue why they just put us together on the fight card. I'm aware of only one connection between us and them, he said, his gaze on me, intensity in his green eyes. I put a hand to my chest. Me? You think I'm the connection? You're the only connection between our house and their family that I'm even aware of, Sentinel. Ethan crossed his arms over his chest. And, unfortunately, I'm aware of only one enemy on your end. There was a moment of silence as the pieces clicked into place. Nick said she called the house, I murmured, then lifted my gaze to Ethan. Selena? You're thinking Selena. Ethan shrugged. We have no evidence of that, of course. But would you consider it beyond her capabilities? Creating chaos? Hardly. That's practically her calling card. Much to our chagrin. And this particular chaos has the added benefit of putting you right in the middle. Ethan shook his head. That email will have been sent by a Katagun vampire. Someone who knows that I showed you the library. More importantly, I interjected. Someone who knows what we said in the library. And someone who knows our social schedule. Someone who knows where we've been going. And who set up Nick with bad information beforehand. He stood up slowly, hands on his hips, and looked back at me, eyes wide. What precisely are you suggesting? There's only one group of vampires who know about the raves and Jamie's supposed story, I said. Only one group who know about our excursions to visit the rich and famous. I paused, wishing he'd reach the conclusion so I wouldn't have to say it aloud. Ethan, it had to be a guard. Chapter 17 Love Bites that declaration got as warm a reception as you might have imagined. Ethan turned away and immediately flipped open his cell phone, unwilling to engage in a discussion about the possibility that our current havoc was being wreaked by one of his own bodyguards. One of my colleagues. Ethan called the house, updating Malik and Luke about the threat, but offering no information about my group of suspects. As if nothing was amiss, the guards were put into full investigation mode, their assignment to identify any and all information regarding the purported threat against Jamie. I was also in full investigation mode, and I'll admit that my suspect list was pretty short. A woman had made a call to the Breckenridge house, and I'd seen Kelly arriving at Katagun after spending the day somewhere else. Had she been the Katagun vampire with the chip on her shoulder? The link to Selena? Eager to solve the mystery, I borrowed the house phone and put in a call to the Umbud's office, updating my grandfather on the evening's revelations. I also talked to the man with the skills I needed. Jeff, I have a problem. I'm glad you finally realized I'm your answer, Merritt. Okay, so the mood wasn't exactly light, but I couldn't help but smile at the comeback. 
Someone's using email to make threats on behalf of Catagon House, I told him, flipping open my cell and pulling up my email client. Ever efficient, Nick had already forwarded the email message. If it was us, we'd get a good solid Aspen steak. But Aspen's too good for you. Maybe quartering. The guts and appendages removed while you're still conscious so that you can feel the pain. Understand what it's like. Drowning? Hanging? A slow death at the tip of a sword? A slice from stem to stern? So that blood and gore and meat are all that's left of you? By the way, the youngest one gets it first. I shivered as I read it, but appreciated that the author of this threat, unlike the last one I'd seen, hadn't tried to rhyme. I also wondered if Kelly was capable of that kind of violence, that kind of anger. Those questions unanswered, I asked Jeff for his email address and sent the message on. Phew, he said after a moment, apparently having reviewed it. That's a doozy. It was a doozy. It was, however, notably empty of details about why, exactly, Jamie had been chosen. That he was a Breckenridge seemed to be the only knock against him. It is a doozy, I told him, and we need to figure out who it came from. Can you work some of your mojo? Easy breezy, Jeff absently said. The sound of furiously clicking keys in the background. He's disguised the IP address, rudimentary stuff. But I'll have to do some backtracking. The email Addy is pretty generic, but being a representative of our fine city, I might be able to make a call. Call away, I told him. But there's one small catch. I need the details on this as soon as you can get them. I checked the time on my cell. It was nearly midnight. How's your schedule looking for the next few hours? Flexible, he said. Assuming the price is right. I rolled my eyes. Name your price. Silence. Jeff? Could I... Can I get back to you on that? I'm kind of at a loss, and I want to make sure I take complete advantage of this situation. I mean, unless you're willing to give me two or three... Jeff, I said, interrupting what was destined to become a very lascivious list. Why don't you just give me a call when you've got something? I'm your man. I mean, not literally, or whatever. I know you and Morgan had kind of a thing going. Although, you're not officially together together, right? Jeff? Yo! Get to work. With our contacts on the trail of information that might mollify the Brex, Ethan and I slipped out of my father's office and headed back through the crowd to the front door. The house was packed and it took us a few minutes of squeezing through, bodies and handshaking, to make it to the other side. I think I managed a polite smile in the direction of the people I passed, but my mind was completely focused on a particular Breckenridge. I didn't understand how he could think I was capable of the accusations he'd leveled against us. How could a childhood romance, a decades-long friendship, turn into something so ugly? I nibbled the edge of my lip as we transversed the crowd, recalling scenes from my childhood. Nick had been my first kiss. We'd been in his father's library, me a girl of eight or nine, wearing a sleeveless party dress with an itchy crinoline petticoat. Nick had called me a dumb girl and kissed me because I dared him to, a quick peck on the lips that seemed to disgust him as much as it delighted me albeit not as much as the fact that I'd beaten him at whatever game we'd been playing. As soon as he'd kissed me, he was off again, running out of his father's office and down the hallway. Boys have cooties, I'd yelled, Mary Jane's clomping as I ran after him. Are you all right? I blinked and looked up. We'd reached the other end of the room. Ethan had stopped and was gazing at me curiously. Just thinking. I said, I'm still in shock about Nick, about his father, about their attitude. We were friends, good friends, Ethan, for a long time. I don't understand how it came to this. There was a time when Nick would have asked me, not accused me. The gift of immortality, Ethan dryly said, then glanced back at Chicago's rich and famous, who sipped champagne while the city buzzed around them. 
infinite opportunities for betrayal. There were a bevy of his own stories behind that little aphorism, I guessed, but I couldn't see past my own. Ethan shook his head as if to clear it, then put a hand at my back. Let's go home, he said. I nodded, not even up to an argument that Cadogan wasn't home. We just moved into the foyer when Ethan stopped, his hand falling away. I glanced up. Morgan stood just inside the door, arms crossed over worn jeans and a long-sleeved white T-shirt. A single brown curl draped rakishly across his forehead, and his blue eyes, accusing blue eyes, stared back at me. I exhaled a curse, realizing what Morgan had seen. Me in a ball gown, Ethan in a tux, his hand at my back. The two of us together in my parents' house, after I couldn't be bothered to return Morgan's phone calls. This was definitely not good. I believe someone has crushed your party, Sentinel, Ethan whispered. I ignored him, and I'd just taken a step toward Morgan when I felt like I was falling through a tunnel. I had to touch Ethan's arm just to keep myself upright. It was the telepathic connection Morgan and I had formed when he challenged Ethan at Cadogan House. The link was supposed to work only between Vampire and Master, which might have been why the link with Morgan had such a strong effect, and why it seemed so wrong. I'm sure you have an explanation, he silently said. I wet my lips, uncurled my fingers from Ethan's arm, and forced my spine straight. I'll meet you outside, I told Ethan. Without waiting for a response, I walked toward Morgan, forcing myself to keep my eyes on his. We need to talk, Morgan said aloud when I reached him, his gaze lifting to the man behind me. At least until that man slipped silently beside us and out the door. Come with me, I said, my voice flat. We followed a concrete hallway to the back of the house, the walls still, imprinted with the grain of their wooden forms. I picked a random door, a breach in the concrete, and opened it. Moonlight streamed through a small square window in the facing wall, providing a single beam of light in the otherwise pitch-black space. I stood quietly for a second, then two, and let my predatory eyes adjust to the darkness. Morgan stepped into the room behind me. Why are you here? I asked him. There was a moment of silence before he met my gaze, one eyebrow raised in accusation. Someone suggested I might see something interesting in Oak Park tonight. So here I am. You're busy working, I assume. I am working, I replied, my tone all business. Who told you we'd be here? Morgan ignored the question. Instead, he arched his eyebrows, and with a look that would have melted a lesser woman, raked his gaze across my body. Had waves of angry magic not radiated from him as he did it, I'd have called the move an invitation. But this was different. A verdict, I think, of my guilt. He crossed his arms over his chest. Is that what he's dressing you in these days while you're... working? He made it sound like I was less a sentinel than a call girl. My voice was tight. Words clipped when I finally spoke. I thought you knew me well enough to know that I wouldn't be here, in my father's house, if there weren't a phenomenally good reason for it. Morgan gave a strangled, mirthless half-laugh. I imagine I can guess what the phenomenally good reason is. Or maybe I should say who the reason is. Cadogan House is the reason. I'm here because I'm working. I can't explain why. But suffice it to say that if you knew, you'd be sufficiently concerned and more supportive than you're being now. Right, Merritt. You blow me off, avoid me, and then turn it around. Blame me for being suspicious, for wanting some answers. You haven't returned my phone calls, and yet... He crossed his hands behind his head. You're the victim here. You should take Mallory's place at McGetrick, great as that spin is. He nodded his head, then looked down at me. Yeah, I think that would really work out well for you. I'm sorry I didn't call you. Things have been a little crazy. Oh, have they? He released his hands, walked toward me. 
He reached out a finger and traced his fingertip across the edge of my bodice. I notice you aren't wearing your sword, Sentinel. His voice was soft, lush. I wasn't buying it. I'm armed, Morgan. Mm-hmm. He lifted his eyes from my chest and met my gaze. I could see the hurt in his face, but that hurt was tempered by anger. Predatory anger. I'd seen him in the same mode before, when he'd challenged Ethan at Cadogan House, wrongly believing that Ethan had threatened Selina. That Ethan had made a move after his own master. Apparently this was a theme for Morgan. The anger of a man who believed another vamp was sniffing around his girl. If you have something to say, I told him, maybe you should just put it out there. He stared at me for a long, long time, neither of us moving, but when he spoke, the words were softer, sadder than I'd expected. Are you fucking him? A kiss in Mallory's hallway or not, we were hardly dating, Morgan and me. He had no right to this kind of jealousy, and certainly no basis for it. I was just about reaching the limit of my tolerance for ignorant men today. My anger rose, peppering my arms with goosebumps. I let it flow around me, working to keep the emotions off my face, the silver out of my eyes, the vampire asleep. You, I began, my voice low and on the edge of fury, are being incredibly presumptuous. Ethan and I are not together, and you and I don't exactly have a commitment. You have no right to accuse me of being unfaithful, much less any basis. Ah, he said, I see. He looked down at me, his expression flat. So you two aren't together? Is that why you danced with him? I could have confessed that it was part of a plan to build relationships, to build connections that it had been intended to get close to a reporter who had the power to make things very, very difficult for vampires, however unlikely that story seemed now. But Morgan had a point. I'd had a choice. I could have walked away. I could have set boundaries with Ethan, could have reminded him that we were at the party for information, not entertainment. I could have reminded him that I'd given up time with friends to do my job, and asked for a pass on the dance. I hadn't done any of those things. Maybe because he was my maker. Maybe because I was duty-bound to accept his orders. Or maybe because in some secret way, I wanted to say yes as much as I'd wanted to tell him no, in spite of the discomfort that I felt around him. Despite the fact that he didn't trust me as much as I deserved. But how could I admit that to Morgan? who'd gate-crashed my parents' party in order to catch me in the act of infidelity. I couldn't, either to me or to him. So I did the only other thing I could think of. I took my exit. I don't need this, I told Morgan, sweeping up my skirt. I turned on my heel and headed for the door. Great, he called after me. Walk away. That's mature, Merritt. I appreciate that. I'm sure you can find your way out. Yeah, sorry to have interrupted your party. You and your boss have a great evening. Sentinel. He spit it like a curse. Maybe it was. But what right did he have to criticize? Ethan was my obligation, my duty, my burden, my liege. I knew it was immature. I knew it was childish and wrong. But I was pissed. And I couldn't help myself. I knew it was the one thing that as a Navarre vamp, Morgan couldn't do. But it was the perfect line, the perfect exit, and I couldn't resist. I glanced back at him, silk swirling around my legs, and a single eyebrow raised, gave him the haughtiest look I could muster. Bite me, I said, and walked away. Ethan was outside, waiting beside the car in the gravel drive. His face was tilted up eyes on the full moon that cast shadows against the house. He lowered his gaze as I began to cross the gravel. Ready? he asked. I nodded and followed him to the car. The mood during the ride back to Hyde Park was even more somber than it had been on the ride to my parents. 
I stared silently out the car window, replaying events. That was three times tonight that I'd managed to alienate people. Mallory, Catcher, Morgan. And for what? Or better yet, for whom? Was I pushing everyone else away in order to get closer to Ethan? I glanced over at him, his gaze on the road, hands at ten and two on the steering wheel. His hair was tucked behind his ears, brow furrowed in concentration as he drove. I'd given up my life as a human for this man, not willingly, of course, but still. Was I giving up everything else? The things I'd brought with me across the transition? My home in Wicker Park? My best friend? I sighed and turned back toward the window. Those questions, I guessed, weren't going to be answered tonight. I was hardly two months into my life as a vampire, and I still had an eternity of Ethan to go. When we reached the house, Ethan parked the car, and we walked up from the basement together. What can I do? I asked when we reached the first floor. Not that I hadn't done enough already on behalf of Cadogan and its master. He frowned, then shook his head. Keep me up to date about Jeff's progress with the email. The masters are investigating on their ends. I'm going to make some calls on my own until they arrive. In the meantime, he paused as if he was debating my skills, then finished. Try the library. See what you can find. I arched my eyebrows. The library? What am I looking for? You're the researcher, Sentinel. Figure that out. Experienced enough to know that a ball gown wasn't appropriate research attire, I returned to my room to change, trading the silk for jeans and a short-sleeved black top. A fusty suit wasn't, to my mind, research attire either. I was relieved, physically relieved, to hang the dress back in the closet, don jeans and pick up my katana. It felt right in my hand. Comforting, as if I'd stepped out of a costume and back into my own skin. I stood in my room for a moment, left hand on the scabbard, right hand on the handle, just breathing. When I was calmer and ready to face the world again, I grabbed a pen and a couple of notebooks, ready to begin my own brand of investigation. The more I thought about it, the more I agreed with Ethan that Selena had a role in this. We didn't have much in the way of evidence but this was totally her style, to sow discord, put the players in motion, and let the battle proceed on its own. I wasn't sure where Kelly fit in, or if she fit in at all, and I didn't exactly have the skills of a private investigator. But I could research, study, peruse the library for information that might give us a clue about Selena's plans, her connections, her history. Whether it would help us in the long run remained to be seen, but it was something proactive, something I had the skills to do. And more importantly, it was something I could sink into, something that could keep my mind off other things, off Morgan and what seemed to be the inevitable end of that relationship, off Ethan and the attraction that, however ill-advised, lingered between us, off Mallory. I found the library quiet and empty, and this time I double-checked, dropped my pens and notebooks on the table, and headed for the shelves. Chapter 18 In the Stacks Late, isn't it? I blinked away black text and looked up, found Ethan walking toward my table. My immersion solution had worked. I hadn't even heard the library door open. Is it? I flipped my wrist to check the time on my watch, but before I read the dial, he announced, It's nearly three o'clock. You look to be engrossed. Over an hour had passed then, since we'd gone our separate ways. I'd been sitting in the chair with my sword poised beside me, pumas discarded beneath the table, legs crossed for most of that time. I scratched my temple and glanced down at the book before me. French Revolution, I told him. Ethan looked confused and crossed his arms over his chest. French Revolution? To what end are you researching the French Revolution? Because we, I, will better understand who she is, what she's after, if we know where she came from. 
You mean Selena? Come here, I told him, flipping through the book to locate the passage I'd found earlier. When he'd reached the opposite side of the table, I turned the book toward him and tapped a finger against the relevant paragraph. Frowning, he braced his hands on the table, leaned forward, and read aloud. The Navarre family owned substantial holdings in the Burgundy region of France, including a chateau near Auxerre. On December 31st, 1785, the oldest daughter, Marie Colette, was born. He glanced up. That would be Selina. I nodded, Selina de Solinay. Nay, Marie Colette Navarre. Vampires change their identities with some frequency. One burden of immortality being the fact that you outlived your name, your family. That tended to make humans a little suspicious. Thus, the name changes. Of course, Ethan had been a vampire for nearly two centuries before Selina had been a twinkle in her parents' aristocratic eyes. And she was a GP member. He'd probably long since memorized her name, date of birth, and hometown. But I thought the next few sentences, hidden away in this petite biography of a long-dead vampire, might be more interesting. Marie, he continued, although born in France, was smuggled to England in 1789 to avoid the harshest persecutions of the Revolution. She became fluent in English and was considered highly intelligent and a rare beauty. She was raised as a foreign-born cousin of the Grenville family, which held the Dukedom of Buckingham. It was assumed that Miss Navarre would marry George Herbert Viscount Penbridge, but the couple was never formally betrothed. George's family later announced his engagement to Miss Anne Dupree of London but George disappeared hours before the marriage was to have taken place. Ethan made a sound of interest, looked up at me. Shall we place any bets as to the disposition of poor George? Unfortunately, that's unnecessary on all accounts. And we know what happened to Selina. She was made a vampire. But what's important is what happened to Anne. I waved a hand at him. Skip to the footnote. He frowned but without taking his gaze away from the book, pulled out the chair in front of him. He settled himself into it, crossing one leg over the other, then arranged the book in his right hand, his left across his lap. George's body was found four days later, he continued. The next day, Anne Dupree eloped with George's cousin Edward. Ethan closed the book, placed it on the table, and frowned at me. I assume you've taken me on a stroll through English social history for a reason. Now you're ready for the punchline, I told him, and pulled from my stack a slim, leather-bound volume, this one providing biographical information about the current members of the Greenwich Presidium. I turned to the page I'd flagged and read aloud. Harold Monmouth, holding the Presidium's fourth position and serving as council pre-elect, was born Edward Fitzwilliam Dupree in London, England, 1774. I lifted my gaze from the book, watched the connections form in his expression. So she and Edward, or Harold, what, plotted together? To have George killed? I closed the book, placed it on the table. Do you remember what she said in the park, right before she attempted to fillet you? Something about humans being callous, about a human breaking her heart? Well, let me lay this out for you from a woman's perspective. You're living in a foreign country with your English cousins because you've been smuggled out of France. You're considered a rare beauty, cousin to a duke, and at the age of 19, you nab your first son of a viscount. That's our George. You want him. Maybe you love him. You certainly love that you've managed to entice him. But just when you think you've sealed the deal, noble George tells you that he's fallen for the daughter of a London merchant. A merchant, Ethan. Someone Selina would have considered far, far beneath her. You don't bear any particular grudge toward Anne. You may even pity her for being less than what you are. I put my elbows on the table, leaned forward. But you don't pity George. 
George, who could have had you, your beauty, your prestige, by his side. He throws you away for London trash. I lowered my voice. Selena would never let that stand. And what if, conveniently, George has an older cousin, a thirty-year-old cousin, who has an attachment to our dear Anne, who is all of sixteen? You and Edward have a conversation. Mutual goals are discussed, plans are made, and George's body is found in a London slum. Plans are made, Ethan repeated, nodding. And two members of the Presidium have a murder between them. The Presidium that released Selena, despite what she'd done in Chicago. I nodded back. Why bother enthralling Presidium members with your glamour, or relying on your charms, as you put it, when you've got that kind of shared history?